This is Audible. Tantor Audio presents The Billionaire and the Virgin by Jessica Clare. Narrated by Jillian Macy. Chapter 1 Marjorie Iverson adjusted the bow on her behind and craned her neck, trying to look in the mirror at the back of her dress. How is this? Fucking awful, said the redhead next to her, in an identical dress. We look more like cupcakes and bridesmaids. Do you guys really hate the dresses? Bronte asked, wringing her hands as the women lined up and studied their reflections in the mirrors. Not at all, said Audrey, who Marjorie knew was the extremely pregnant, nice one. Audrey elbowed the not-as-nice redhead next to her, who was her sister. I think they're lovely dresses, and you do too. No, I don't. Again, she elbowed her sister and turned to Marjorie. What do you think of the dress, Marge? Her eyes were trying to convey a hint that the other woman was just not getting. I love it, Marjorie lied, casting a brilliant smile at Bronte. Truth was, all that red and white made her look a bit like a barber pole with a bow. But Bronte had worked long and hard to pick out dresses and had paid for everything. So how on earth could Marjorie possibly complain? She'd seen the price tag for this thing. Apparently they'd been custom-made by a fashion designer, and the price of just one dress cost more than Marjorie would make in months. Bronte was spending a lot on her wedding, and Marjorie didn't want to be the one to kick up a fuss. So she adjusted the bow on her behind again and nodded. It's beautiful. I feel like a princess. Bronte smiled relieved. Ugh, you're so full of shit, Gretchen began, only to be elbowed by the pregnant one again. I think I need this let out a bit more on the sides, Audrey said, waving over the dressmaker. My hips keep spreading. A woman ran over with pins in her mouth, kneeling at Audrey's side, as Marjorie gazed at the lineup of Bronte's bridesmaids. There was herself, a six-foot-one Nordic blonde, there was Gretchen, a shorter, curvier woman with screamingly red hair that almost clashed with her dress, except for the fact that she was the maid of honor, so her mermaid-cut gown was more white than red. There was Gretchen's sister Audrey, who was a pale, freckled redhead and heavily pregnant. And sitting in a corner, beaming at them as if it were her own wedding, was a frizzy-headed blonde named May Lee, who was currently being stitched into her bridesmaid's dress. Apparently she was a last-minute addition to the wedding party, and so her dress had to be fitted on the fly. Gretchen fussed with a swishing tool gathered tightly at the knees by decorative red lace. My wedding is going to be in black and white, I swear to God, because this shit is ridiculous. So, what made you decide to have a destination wedding, Braun? Marjorie interrupted, trying to be the peacemaker. She was a little disturbed at Gretchen's rather vocal opinions about the dresses and sought to change the subject. Bronte beamed at Marge, looking a little like her old self. This is where I met Logan, remember? We got stuck here when I won that trip from the radio and the hurricane hit. She grabbed Maylee's hands and helped the other woman to her feet as another tailor fussed over the hems. Logan bought the island and decided to renovate the hotel. He pushed for them to have it done this week so we could get married here. Isn't that sweet? Sweet, Marjorie echoed, adjusting the deep V of her neckline. Truth be told, her brain had stopped processing once Bronte had said, Bought the island. Marge was still weirded out by the fact that Bronte, quirky philosophy-quoting Bronte, had dated a billionaire, and now they were getting married. In her eyes, she always saw Bronte as a waitress, just like herself. They'd worked together at a 50s sock hop diner in Kansas City for the last year or two, at least until Bronte had moved to New York City to be with Logan. It was something out of a fairy tale, or a movie, depending on which was your drug of choice. Either way, it didn't seem like something that happened to normal people. You're so lucky, Bronte. I hope I can meet a guy as wonderful as Logan some day. Hope is a waking dream, Bronte said, with a soft smile. Aristotle. Gretchen snorted, only to be thwapped by her sister again. 
Bless your heart, Bronte, for paying for everything so we could all be here with you, Maylie gushed, striding forward to line up with the other bridesmaids. Look at us. We're all so lovely, aren't we? She put a friendly arm around Marjorie's waist and beamed up at her. Like a bunch of roses getting ready for the parade. I believe they are floats in a parade, Maylie, Gretchen said dryly. Which, now that you mention it... Marjorie giggled, unable to stifle the sound behind her hand. So, who are we missing? Audrey asked, counting heads. I know Jonathan and Kate are also groomsmen, right? That's five groomsmen, and I only count four bridesmaids here. What about Jonathan's lady love? What's her name? Violet, Bronte added. And I offered for her to be in the wedding, but she declined since we're not familiar with each other truly. Logan wanted me to add her to the bridesmaid lineup to make Jonathan happy, but Violet insisted on simply attending. She strode forward and adjusted the lace band under Marjorie's bust. Does this look crooked to you? Anyhow, Angie's flying in, but her kid was having dental surgery today, so she's not coming in until tomorrow. Marjorie smiled at Bronte meekly. She'd feel a lot better when Angie was here. She, Bronte, and Angie had all waited tables together, along with Sharon, but no one liked Sharon. At the diner, Angie was in her forties, motherly, and wonderful to be around. They often went to bingo together. Gretchen nudged Marjorie. So, do you have a date for the wedding? Bringing yourself a man in the hopes he'll catch the garter? I do have a date, Marjorie said. His name's Dewey. I met him playing shuffleboard. Dewey? He sounds ancient. I believe he's in his eighties, Marjorie said with a grin. Very sweet man. Ah, I getcha. Gretchen gave Marjorie an exaggerated wink. Sugar daddy, right? What? No, Dewey's just nice. He's on vacation because his wife recently died and he needs a distraction. He seemed so lonely that I invited him to be my date at the wedding. Nothing more than that. He's a sweet man. Leave her alone, Gretchen, Bronte said, butting in. Marjorie always finds herself a sweet old guy to dote on. Bronte gave her a speculative look. I don't think I've ever seen her out with anyone under the age of seventy. Bronte knew her well. Marjorie smiled at that. I guess I'm pretty obvious. I just, you know, have a lot more in common with guys like Dewey than most people. It was true. She didn't really date older men. She just spent her time playing bingo with friends and shuffleboard and going to knitting circles and volunteering at the nursing home when she could. Her parents had died long before Marjorie could remember their faces, and so she'd been raised by Grandma and Grandpa. Marjorie had grown up quilting, canning, watching the prices right, and basically surrounded by people four times her age. It was something she never grew out of, either. Even at the age of twenty-four, she felt more comfortable with people in their eighties than people in their twenties. People her age never sat and relaxed on a Saturday morning with a cup of coffee and a crossword. They never just sat around and talked. They took selfies and got rip-roaring drunk and partied all night long. And that just wasn't Marjorie. She was old-fashioned. Body of a really lanky twenty-four-year-old. Soul of a geriatric. That was another thing that the elderly never made her feel weird about. Marjorie was tall. At six foot one, she was taller than every woman and most men. No one wanted to date someone that tall, and most women looked at her like she was some sort of freak of nature. Not her grandma and grandpa. They'd always made her feel beautiful, despite her height. So, yeah, with the exception of Bronte, all of Marjorie's friends were living in retirement homes. Well, I think we're good on the fitting for now, Bronte said as the tailors finished their measurements. Everyone out of their gowns. Go enjoy the day, and I'll see you ladies tonight for the pre-bachelorette party. Maylee giggled, and Gretchen high-fived everyone. Audrey only patted her rounded belly. Guess I'm the designated driver. They shimmied carefully out of the fitted gowns and changed back into their clothing. Marjorie had brought her beachwear with her just in case.
and changed into her red and white polka dotted one piece swimsuit, then wrapped a sarong around her hips, stuffing her clothing into a bag. It was a lovely day for a walk on the beach, and she had a few hours before afternoon shuffleboard started up, anyhow. Chapter Two Look, look, tits are GTFO, right? The woman frolicking in the water near Robert Cannon's float pulled off her top and shook her extremely fake cans in his direction. He raised his drink to her, inwardly wishing she'd go away and take her friend with her. He touched his Bluetooth earpiece to indicate to her that he was on a conference call, despite floating on a raft at the beach, mixed drink in hand. He was several feet out from shore, and when people paddled closer, he stuck a hand in the water and steered his raft further out so he could concentrate on his call. What do you mean, ratings are down? Just that, said his assistant, voice tinny over the headset. Reports are in, and despite the new shows, ratings are down for the man channel by two percentage points. Rob swore and took another swig of his drink. Near his raft, one of the beach bunnies grabbed another tanned girl. Looking over at him, they began to make out in an attempt to get his attention. He ignored them and paddled a bit further out. Fucking typical. What about the new show? Rob asked. Hell, if he was down two points despite the new show, he'd need a much stiffer drink. This one wasn't doing much to sustain his buzz. Naked frat party? Well, despite heavy marketing, it looks like we're not hitting that target 18 to 40 demographic. I'm not sure what the deal is. Robert swore again. And advertisers? Already making unhappy noises. Great, that was just what he fucking needed. He swigged his drink, emptying the glass, and waved it at one of the beach bunnies. On cue, one of the women took it and headed to the shore to get him a refill, her tits bouncing in her tiny bikini. I'll make some calls when I get back, all right? Just hold down the fort for this week while I take care of things down here. Any luck with Hawkings? Not yet, but I'm hoping to make some progress, Rob told him absently, watching the antics of the two women. They kissed again and then looked over at him to see if he was paying attention. One of them waded back out to his raft, his drink in hand. Rob shook his head. Ridiculous creatures. He'd become jaded on people long ago, and these two weren't changing his mind. That was for damn sure. He shifted in his raft and adjusted the headset. I'll keep you posted. In the meantime, I want a full write-up of all of the overnight ratings and a comparison of ad revenue. Have it to me by the morning. Will do and find out at what point those ratings dropped, which show tanked. Call me back. Will do. He clicked off the call and tilted his head back, letting the sun beat down through his Bugatti sunglasses. Fucking hell. With ratings down, he was going to have a hell of a time convincing Logan Hawkins that starting up a new cable channel aimed at white-collar businessmen and executives was going to be worth his while. Not that Rob couldn't bankroll it himself, the billions in his bank account said differently. But he wanted Hawking's stamp on it, because Hawking's knew everyone in New York City and had a lot of cachet that Rob didn't. People respected him and his business. They didn't respect Rob's, no matter how much money it made him. Most of the time, he didn't give a shit. Notoriety had made him as much money as anything else. And if he'd made his fortune capitalizing on cable channels and radio networks designed for the average Joe... So much the better. So some of his shows weren't exactly above board. So what? Tits or GTFO was still popular. As long as there were girls with low self-esteem waiting to get on camera, they'd make money. And he wouldn't feel bad about it. It wrecked his social life, but he'd just cry into his piles of money. Every woman that was even halfway interested in him wanted his wallet or to be on one of his shows. The only girls he seemed to attract anymore were vapid idiots like the two currently making out and cavorting in the water in front of him just to get his attention. Didn't care, really. Rob took the drink that Blonde Number One offered him and tasted it. Strong, just the way he liked it. Thanks, sugar. So, she said, giving her body a little wiggle to get his attention. Think I've got what it takes to be on one of your shows? Maybe, he said absently taking a bigger swig of his drink. 
Christ, that was really strong. He took another swig, because why not? He needed to get good and drunk. Two fucking ratings points. Jesus. The other girl swam up next to him. I heard you did lines off of Tiffany West's stomach in can, she said with a sultry smile. Did you? How nice, he said flatly. He didn't even know who Tiffany West was, and he sure as shit didn't do drugs. Alcohol was easy. Drugs just made you end up at someone's prison, bitch. He gulped the drink again, pleased that an alcoholic buzz was kicking in. He'd had three of these babies already, and number four was going to get him good and toasted, which was a good thing if ratings were down. The busty blondes weren't leaving. One swam up to the side of his raft, nudging it further out into the water. She smiled up at him. Want to do lines off of my stomach? I'm busy. Another call was due to come in any minute now. I can save the good stuff for later if you want to party. Fuck that. Party of one in his raft right here. He tossed down the rest of his drink, enjoying the burn it left in his mouth, and handed it off to one of the girls, who watched him expectantly. When they didn't go away, he looked back over at them. How about you and you, he said, pointing at both of them. Go do lines together and leave me the fuck alone. One of the blondes gave him a furious look and stormed away. The other wasn't quite so nice. She huffed up, her fake breasts rising, and then gave his raft a vicious shove. Rob flipped over and landed in the water, head going under. Fucking perfect. His head spun, and he resurfaced long enough to glare at the women who laughed. One of those two was going to buy him a new Bluetooth headset, so help him. One of his legs cramped up, shooting pain through his muscles. Rob bobbed back under the water, thrashing. It was like his leg had locked up. Combine that with his spinning head, and he couldn't quite get his bearings. He dragged his hands at the water, but only succeeded in getting a mouthful of brine, and even more turned around. The current ripped at him, stronger than he'd ever thought. He pushed against it, but he still couldn't find the surface, and now the water was dragging him farther away from the shore. Huh, riptide. He thought you had to be farther out for those sorts of things. His lungs were aching, and he tried to push his head back above the water, but it seemed farther and farther out of reach. God damn it! Was he going to drown on the beach of some place named Sea Turtle K? Really? But he couldn't find air. Reflexively, his throat worked, and salt water filled his lungs, his mouth, his nose. He choked, and the world started to go black. He was really, truly dying. His last thought was that he'd be in the tabloids for forever now, legendary for drowning in a few feet of water at the beach. More blackness filled his vision, then red, and white polka dots. Polka dots? A strong arm grabbed him, and suddenly Rob's face was hauled against a pair of breasts, real breasts. He barely had time to process this, before more darkness swam through his mind, and he followed it under. Breathe, a voice shouted in his ear, and then lips pressed against his mouth. Air pushed into his lungs, and fuck, that hurt like hell. And suddenly water was coming up out of his throat and his nose, and he turned his head to the side, vomiting salt water. His head ached in the most blisteringly awful fashion, and those white polka dots were swimming in his vision again. But there was sand under his back, and slowly, blearily, he focused his eyes. An angel bent over him on the beach, an angel with a faint peppering of freckles across her nose, a strong jaw, and messy, wet, blonde hair, and dressed in the ugliest polka-dotted swimsuit he'd ever seen, and she was smiling down at him. She'd saved him, and the look she gave him was so shy and proud all at once that he felt his heart swell. Rob was in love. Oh, sweet Lord, this man was gorgeous. Marjorie pressed her mouth to the unconscious man's lips and blew, trying to remember CPR steps that she hadn't done since the fifth grade. She hoped he wouldn't mind that a girl like her was mouthing on him, but she figured saving someone's life took priority over petty things like attractiveness in a rescuer. 
So she pumped his chest and blew into his mouth, and on her second round, salt water came rushing out of his mouth into hers, and she pulled away and spat, even as she turned him on his side so he could vomit. A moment later, he turned on his back and gave her a dazed, dopey look. She couldn't help smiling down at him. What a cute man! He was dark-haired, had green eyes with interesting amber flecks, and a fantastic chiseled nose. He'd also tasted like alcohol when she'd put her mouth on him. Not Marge's favorite thing, but this was a resort and most people drank. He opened his mouth and made a garbled sort of sound, probably a thank you of some kind. Marjorie patted his shoulder. You'll be all right now, mister. Just take a few deep breaths and maybe lay off the tequila when you go swimming. His brows drew together, and he grabbed at her hand, which surprised Marjorie. His lips moved as he gazed up at her, but then he coughed again, still squeezing her hand as if he didn't want to let her go. Shadows fell from overhead as onlookers rushed over to see what was going on. No surprise. They had probably stared at the sight of a string bean like Marjorie carrying a guy out of the water. Thanks to her height, she didn't exactly blend into a crowd. Still coughing, he squeezed her hand again. She squeezed it back, wondering what he was trying to say. A lock of wet black hair was plastered to his forehead, and her fingers itched to push it back. There was just something about his face that she liked so, so much, and the way he looked at her with that interested surprise, not the instinctive flinch she normally got when she towered over men. Of course, he probably didn't realize how tall she was, since she was currently sitting on the sand next to him. You, he began, still wheezing with a wet sound in his throat. Everyone get back, a voice roared, and a man pushed forward in a red lifeguard suit, carrying a red flotation device. Let's give him some air. Reluctantly, Marjorie squeezed his hand one last time and got to her feet. I think he's okay. I said get back, the lifeguard said, thrusting an arm out and pushing people away as they crowded around the fallen man. Everyone, please, let a lifeguard do his job. Meekly, Marjorie brushed the sand off her knees and moved back with the crowd. She desperately wanted to look back at the handsome man in the sand again, but that would have been foolish, wouldn't it? With a small sigh, she found her discarded wrap, tied it around her hips, and headed off to shuffleboard to meet her friend Agnes. For some reason, she felt a little down. It was selfish of her, but she'd wanted to talk to the man she'd rescued if nothing else, to hear him speak other than coughing at her. But she supposed that was just vanity. What did she want, a thank you for saving a man's life? She mulled this over as she crossed the long winding beach, heading back toward the hotel. The weather in Sea Turtle Cay was utterly gorgeous, and she couldn't stay down for long. By the time she reached the shuffleboard area, her mood was back to its normal, even keel. Not much kept Marjorie down. Agnes waved at her from the far end of the shuffleboard court. She was wearing a white, floppy straw hat and had an equally white smear of zinc on her hawkish nose, and she wore the loose floral layers that so many of the elderly seemed to favor. "'There you are, sweetie,' Agnes said when Marjorie approached. "'We were starting to wonder if you'd ditched us.' Next to Agnes, her friend Edna had on a pair of enormous red sunglasses and a similar outfit. Not that I'd blame you for something like that, Edna said with a titter. There are lots of good-looking men here. Don't be silly, Marjorie said, grabbing a shuffleboard stick. I wouldn't abandon you guys. You're my friends, and I have a great time with you. Wouldn't you rather be with people your own age? Not at all, Marjorie said, and then leaned in. Though I was late because I was kissing a man on the beach. Both women gave scandalized laughs. You what? Agnes said. She knew they'd get a kick out of that. With a grin, she recapped the rescue on the beach, going into great detail about how handsome and helpless the man she'd saved was. Her friends laughed through the entire story, though they were disappointed at the lackluster ending. You should have given that young man your phone number and hooked up with him, said Edna was probably ninety-five years old if she was a day. Tap that ass. 
Marjorie blushed and shook her head. Trust me when I say I'm not his type. A guy that good looking? He'd probably have one of the busty beach bunnies in string bikinis that she saw wandering all over the place. Now, should we play singles or do you guys want to be a team? You know I can kick your butts at this game with one hand tied behind my back. You're on, said Agnes, with a crafty gleam in her eye. I told you I'm fucking fine. Leave me alone. Rob gave an irritated swat to the paramedic trying to take his blood pressure. You want to know what my blood pressure is? It's going to be through the goddamn roof if you keep trying to stick that cuff on me. We have procedures we have to follow, sir, the overachieving lifeguard told him. Their little party had moved away from the sandy beach and set up in a nearby first aid hut to give them a bit more privacy. Unfortunately, it seemed that that privacy didn't extend to the lifeguards, who were now hovering worse than the onlookers on the beach. Damn lifeguards! Dudley Do-Right, who had taken charge of the flock of useless lifeguards, spoke again. Once you've been declared well by the medical team, I'll need you to come with me so we can file an incident report. We take things very seriously here at Sea Turtle K Resort, and... Rob cut him off with an icy glare. He jerked his arm away from the man, still trying to put that damn blood pressure cuff on him. How much do I have to pay you people to go away? Seriously, I'm fine. I was drinking too much. I fell into the water, and that girl saved me. Now, if you want to be fucking helpful, you'll get me her name and phone number so I can thank her. I don't know who you're referring to, sir, Dudley Do-Right said with a frown. Of course you fucking don't, Rob said gritting his teeth, because you fucking scared her off. This was not his favorite afternoon. First the dumb beach bunnies had tried to drown him. He'd lost his Bluetooth headset, and his phone was probably buried in some kid's sandcastle on the beach. Then he'd been rescued from the water by that gorgeous sea nymph with the freckles. And God, it was the first time he'd ever been aroused by the thought of freckles. But as soon as Dudley do had stepped in, she'd vanished without a trace. And that was driving him bugfuck. He wanted to know more about her, her name, who she was, if she was single, if she'd laugh at his crass jokes without looking at him like he was a pig, if she'd give him that soft, sweet, adoring look when he kissed her, if she had freckles on her thighs. But that opportunity was fucking gone, thanks to the incompetent medical team here at the resort. He yanked his arm out of the medic's grasp again. Get the fuck away from me, all of you, before I sue. The magic word, sue, never failed to clear a room. Dudley Do-Right mumbled something about filing paperwork and sending it to him to approve later, and they left him alone. Finally. Rob flexed his arm and stood up. He felt achy all over, and his head throbbed. His throat felt like hell, and he wanted a drink. But more than that, he wanted to find his rescuer. The polka dot girl. Right now, she was his obsession. Because when Rob Cannon had an obsession, he clung to it like a dog with a bone until things worked out in his favor. And they always worked out in his favor. By mid afternoon, Rob had sent all three of his assistants away from working on ratings numbers, and instead, people watching at various locations at the resort, looking for the girl he'd described. One was staked out on the beach, one at the bar, and one at the pool. No one spotted her, and it pissed him off. Either they were incompetent, or she'd disappeared. He refused to entertain that thought. She would be found. He always got what he wanted, and right now, he wanted her. But all afternoon, no sightings turned up, and in frustration, Rob decided to head to the hotel bar himself that night. She was bound to come down for a drink at some point, right? Most of the women at the resort treated the all-expenses-paid bar as an excuse to get plastered on a nightly basis. Surely she'd at least swing down for a Mai Tai or a piña colada. Then he could thank her for saving his life, find out what it took to get her in his bed, and get her out of his mind so he could go back to work with his head clear and his dick serviced. So he sat at the bar in the perfect spot to watch the door ran up a tab on good scotch, and got progressively more annoyed. Where was this woman? He hadn't imagined her. 
If he'd imagined her, she'd have been enormously endowed, and not wearing polka dots, that was for damn sure. Rob was so lost in thoughts of his mystery girl that he did a double take when the tall man in the expensive suit walked into the bar, looked around, and then headed in his direction. Well, well, well. Rob tossed back his scotch and stood up, extending his hand as he approached. If it isn't Logan Hawkins, fancy meeting you here. Logan took one look at Rob's extended hand, and then gave him a withering glance. Well, if this wasn't a fucking grand start, he didn't know what was. Rob kept the smile on his face and put his hand down. He'd keep his cool, even if right now he wanted to punch someone. He needed Logan, whether he liked it or not. Just the man I wanted to see. The cold man in the business suit eyed Rob's Hawaiian shirt and cargo shorts and the drink in his hand. Security alerted me to the fact that you were here. Gotta love security. He raised his glass in a mock toast. I don't suppose you'll tell me why you've chosen to lurk at my resort this week? He sounded pissy as fuck to Rob's ears. Lurking, eh? Fuck you too, buddy. Little Birdie in New York told me you'd be here, and I thought I'd come say hello, since you won't return my calls. I imagine there's a reason for that. His hands remained in his pockets, his expression unfriendly. This didn't deter Rob. He was used to people icing him out because of who he was and what he produced. But damn it, there was a market there, and he'd be an idiot to let opportunity go by. So his man channel was full of ridiculous game shows and lots of tits. That was what men liked, and the ratings proved it. Before the man channel had even been on the air for five years, he had three additional spin-off channels, a few on-demand channels, and a robust business online with interrelated sites. Business was booming. He'd made billions off of peddling the right product to the right people. But now that he had money and success, he wanted credibility, and that was the one thing he couldn't get on his own, which was why he needed Logan Hawking. People respected him. He'd been in Time, Forbes, Newsweek, and countless other magazines as a businessman to watch. The only rags that Rob made were tabloids. They loved to run stories about which down-on-her-luck boozy actress he was fucking. He wasn't. Which coke-fueled orgy someone had seen him exiting. He didn't do drugs. And anything else they could come up with. Normally, he let that shit stand, because even bad publicity was publicity. But now that he wanted to bring investors in on a new project, it was working against him. I'm telling you, Rob said, his tone easy. It didn't give a hint of the frustration he felt at Logan Stonewall. I have a business proposition that can make both of us real money if you'd just talk to me. And I'm telling you, Logan said, in that cold, cold voice that I don't like you here this week. The paparazzi follow you like bitches in heat. Well, that they did. Don't worry. Your ass is too boring for them most of the time. The look Logan gave him could have shriveled dicks from a mile away. He moved closer to Rob, and his voice lowered to an angry hiss. I am getting married this week, and the last thing I want is a bunch of paparazzi mucking up the works. My bride has worked very hard to ensure that everything in this wedding goes off exactly how she wants it to, and I'll be damned if you show up and ruin this for her. Do you understand me? Married? Well, that explained the growly bear act. Rob put on his most charming smile. Congrats, man. Can I buy you a drink? You can leave the premises. Now that would be a shame. Might have to tell all the paps why I'm leaving, and wouldn't they like to know? Rob's smile remained easy, despite the menace he was throwing down. I'd hate to give them fuel to stick around. Logan's glare got colder. Congratulations on the wedding, though. I'd love to be invited. You're not invited. Too bad. I'll settle for a business meeting with you. Just a half hour of your time. I promise it's worthwhile. I'm not here on business this week, and this isn't the way to get my ear. He leaned in. And if you ruin my wedding, I will fucking ruin you. So defensive over a dog and pony show. 
The man must truly be in love. Rob smiled thinly. See you around, then. Chapter 3 After reviewing several dismal ratings reports in the privacy of his suite, Rob was in a shit mood. His botched meeting with Logan hadn't helped things, and by the time three in the morning rolled around, he was done with Sea Turtle K, done with jackasses who didn't want to give him the time of day, and done with a lot of things. Unable to sleep, he phoned up his assistants and told them to pack up and be down at the lobby within an hour. They were heading back to California. After all, there was no point in hanging around in the Caribbean, not getting any work done, when he could be back in California not getting work done. And he sure as shit wasn't going to the beach again. Not after the near drowning. He'd be happy to never hit the fucking waves ever again. At 4 a.m., two of his assistants were in the lobby with their luggage, yawning, and the third was nowhere to be found. Impatient, Rob checked his watch again and handed his bags to the valet, who scurried away. Everyone just stood there like lumps, clearly waiting for instructions. Get a fucking cab here, ASAP, he said to one of his assistants. I'm tired of this place. Yes, sir, the pimple-faced kid said. Right away, sir. Good. He peered at the guy. He knew he was an assistant, but wasn't sure of the name. Which one are you? Crescent, sir. Okay, Crescent, you get to keep your job because you know how to follow orders. At the guy's relieved look, Rob rolled his eyes inwardly. So hard to find good help. He pulled out his phone and texted the missing assistant again. You have three minutes to get your ass down here or you're fired. As he was looking down at his phone, someone bumped into him and the phone went flying out of his hand. In a rage, he turned on the person that pushed him. What the fuck are you doing? It was a drunk woman with bright red hair, her arm around a brunette's shoulders. Both of them were wearing what looked like Mardi Gras beads covered with penises. Oh, slurred the redhead. Oops, my bad. We didn't see you there. She peered at him. Great, just what he needed. Is this entire resort full of drunks? He stalked away from the woman and recovered his phone, checking the screen. No cracks. Thank God for that. You're lucky this isn't broken, or you'd be buying a new one. The brunette's eyebrows drew together, and she looked as if she'd protest, but the redhead stumbled forward and pointed a finger at his face. Don't be a dick, sir. We saw plenty of those tonight. We're full up. The brunette convulsed into laughter. Get your finger out of my face, he told the obnoxious redhead, and looked over at the front desk. And where's my damn cab already? This fucking island isn't that big. We just left one, the redhead said, still wiggling her finger in his face. But you can't have it. Like hell he couldn't. Shouldering past the two drunks, he headed for the curb outside, just in time to see three other women emerging from the cab. A pretty blonde, with a wild haystack of hair, was drunk and hanging off of an extremely pregnant woman and a lean woman had her back to him, her front half in to the passenger window, paying the driver. Good. Rob pushed forward and tapped the taller blonde on the shoulder. If you and your drunk friends are done making everyone miserable, I'd like your cab. As the woman turned, Rob realized two things. One, that it was the woman who'd rescued him on the beach. And two, that she was really, really damn tall. Chapter 4 The woman's eyes widened in surprise at the same time that his did. Oh, it's you, she breathed, and a smile lit up her face. My swimmer. Hi again. Feeling better? Rob stared. He looked her up and down, his first time to really get a good look at her. She was tall as fuck. There was no disguising that. He was six foot himself, and he was pretty sure she had at least an inch on him. She was also wearing high heels, which made her seem towering. She was delicate for her height, but still had an attractive pair of small high breasts and an impressive curve to her hips, and legs that went on forever in the dowdy skirt she was wearing. So she was tall. So fucking what? He didn't care if she was seven foot. She was just as gorgeous as he remembered, in all the right ways. 
Oh, she wasn't the typical Hollywood girl that was considered beautiful right now. Those freckles still spattered her nose, and her hair was a tangled mess about her shoulders. Her lips weren't plumped full of collagen, and her jaw was probably too strong. But her eyes were beautiful, and her expression was full of genuineness, and he wanted to just grab her and pull her against him and soak in everything that she was. Which was weird, but there it was. So he thrust his hand out. I don't think we got to meet properly the other day. I'm Rob. She bit her lip. God, that was fucking cute. And put her hand into his and shook it, surprisingly firmly. I'm Marjorie. Ooh, look, Marge is picking up men at the curb, someone Cad called drunkenly. Probably that damn redhead. Marjorie's face flushed bright red, and she glanced back at her friends. Are they bothering you, mister? I'm sorry. We're just getting back from a bachelorette party. A lock of hair dragged across her cheek from the wind, and she tucked it behind an ear absently. Actually, it's a pre-bachelorette party. This one was bridesmaids only. The real one is in a few days. I think some of the girls got a little carried away with the fun. It's all right, he told her easily, though it wasn't all right thirty seconds ago, even. And it's Rob, not Mr. Rob she said shyly, hugging her arms against her chest. But if you're just getting back from a party, where's your beads? He couldn't help himself. He reached forward and flicked the pearl choker at her neck, classy and dowdy all at once. It was like something his grandma would wear, actually everything she wore, from the floral high-necked blouse to the ugly hippie skirt, was like something his grandma would wear on vacation except for the tall, nude fuck-me-pumps. He liked those. He liked those a lot. She immediately put a hand to her necklace where he touched it, as if scandalized. Then she shook her head and looked awkward and shy. Beads? Nothing like that for me. I don't see why, he said honestly. You're the most beautiful one of the group. She gave him a shocked look and then turned an adorable bright red again. God, was his dick hard? It was. This girl was like catnip to his jaded senses. That's kind of you to say, she told him, clearly flustered. But, um, I've made you uncomfortable, he said, taking the lead. She looked ready to run away, and he wasn't ready for that. Rob stepped forward and placed his hand out, palm up. She hesitated a moment, then put her hand back in his, as if fascinated. He lifted her hand to his mouth and brushed his lips over her knuckles. Her breasts moved, and he realized she was breathing fast with excitement. Every expression was obvious across her face, and he fucking dug that. There were no games with this girl, he realized. She wouldn't be able to play games and try to change herself to be whatever she thought might get his attention. She was genuine, from the tips of her messy hair to those tall, tall shoes. And he loved that. He really, really did. So Rob brushed his mouth over her knuckles again, and then glanced up at her. I want to thank you for saving my life. Oh, she said, clearly flustered. Her hand moved in his as if she needed to draw it away, but he held on to her. It's not necessary, really. It is, he said in a firm voice. I must insist. Let me take you to dinner. My treat. It's the very least I can do for your impeccable life-saving skills. My life-saving skills, she echoed, and then laughed. You nut. That was CPR. Everyone knows CPR. I don't he said, grinning. He ran his thumb over her knuckles. You want to show me? I can think of a few parts I'd like to practice. Her eyes widened and her mouth worked for a moment, and then she nodded. Um, okay. He didn't miss that her gaze flicked to his lips. He liked that it did. He wanted to know what she was thinking. Mr. Cannon, his worthless assistant said, running forward with the worst fucking timing in the world. I've called you a cab, and Mr. Gortham has come downstairs. 
Not now, Rob said, his tone easy, his gaze locked on Marjorie's flushed face. He wanted to memorize it. God, she was pretty. He'd never been so immediately in lust with a woman, but this one had his number, that was for sure. Normally they bored him, because they were all the same. He had a sneaking suspicion he'd never get bored with Marjorie and her openness. But, the assistant said, clearly confused, you instructed us. Rob clenched his teeth and looked over. There stood the bellhop with the porter card of his luggage and his other two assistants sleepily yawning, their own luggage tucked under their arms. Assistant number three was hovering, clearly confused at the change in orders. Everyone was waiting on him. He felt Marjorie's hand attempt to pull out of his again. Are you leaving? she asked. Nope, he lied. But Mr. Cannon, started the assistant again. He clearly wanted to get fired. I said no, Rob repeated. Didn't they teach you that in school? No means no. He kept his tone pleasant and looked back at the small crowd waiting. Everyone can go back to their rooms. It was all a mistake. I really should go, Marjorie said, attempting to pull her hand from his again. My friends are probably in the lobby waiting for me. Not yet, Rob said, squeezing her hand tighter in his. Please. He was probably going to fucking scare her if he didn't let go of her hand, but he didn't want her to retreat again, not before he got her room number and her full name. She hesitated, clearly torn, and glanced at his assistant. I'm not keeping you? Not at all. He looked over at the others. Go back to bed. Muttering, they slowly returned to the lobby. Not fast enough to suit Rob, but they were moving. A throat cleared behind him, and he saw the cab driver waiting. Marjorie still stood at the curb, close to the cab. Right. He wanted to get rid of this man, too. He wanted Marjorie all to himself. So... Reluctantly releasing her hand, Rob dug into his pockets and pulled out his wallet. Peeling a couple of hundreds out of his billfold, he handed them to the driver. Here, thanks for waiting, but you're not needed. The driver took the money and pocketed it without a word. Now Rob was free to devote his attention back to Marjorie, giving her his most charming smile. As I was saying, dinner... I thought you said you wanted CPR lessons. Her lips twitched with amusement. So fucking cute. He'd be masturbating to that sweet little smile of hers for weeks. Changed my mind. Dinner. Tomorrow night. You and me. She shook her head. You don't have to thank me for saving your life with dinner. Really. I'm not. Rob moved forward and put his hands on her shoulders then hugged her before she could protest. A muffled squeak escaped her, but that was the only sound, and he pulled away just as quickly. That was for saving my life. Dinner is because I want to have dinner with you. Marjorie blinked rapidly, still a bit stiff from recoiling from his hug. He guessed she wasn't much of a hugger. She seemed too awkward for that sort of thing. Didn't matter. He'd ease her into his brash displays. She'd get used to him. So, seven? Seafood okay? Okay, she said. Wear a dress. Okay. Good, he grinned, resisted the urge to give her another hug, and then turned to walk away. He paused and turned back to her. Give me your full name and your room number. Okay, she said, her voice just as blank. Tired? Surprised? He couldn't tell. Didn't matter. He'd have all of dinner tomorrow night to figure Marjorie out, and then he'd have her in his bed. He'd fuck her a few times to get her out of his mind, and then he could go back to work and not think about women with incredibly long legs and freckled noses and too earnest smiles. She wasn't saying anything else, so he prompted her. Room number? Just in case I have to call you. 301, she told him. Iverson. He pulled out his phone and started typing. You're in the Iverson suite? No, my last name is Iverson. Marjorie Iverson. He nodded. Well, it was a pleasure to finally meet you, Marjorie Iverson. 
I look forward to seeing you for dinner tomorrow night at seven. Shall we meet at the bar? She nodded again and stuck her hand out to him to shake. Amused, he took her hand and lifted it to his mouth to kiss the back of it one more time. Until tomorrow. Sure enough, she blushed again, then turned and left, her walk back inside the hotel, stiff and a little rushed. He watched her go, those impossibly long legs practically dancing as she went up the three stairs to the lobby itself. He couldn't wait to have those wrapped around his waist. Hot damn. As she left, he realized she didn't bother to ask for his last name. He deliberately had him volunteered it, just to see if she'd inquire. Most women recognized the name once they saw his face, and he knew they'd start Googling him the moment he left. But Marjorie had smiled politely, tried to shake his hand, and walked away. Marjorie was more naive than he'd originally thought. Trusting. She wasn't going to spend all night Googling him online. Well, that worked for him just fine. He could handle naive. It never stopped him for long. But even as he thought that, he frowned to himself. Marjorie was different. She was good, wholesome pure and sweet. He didn't want to fuck up her purity of spirit. The other chicks he dated might be nail and bail, but he knew instinctively that Marjorie wasn't like that, and it was shitty of him to think of her that way. Maybe it was him putting her on a pedestal because she'd saved his life. He didn't know and didn't much care. But as Rob strolled back to his room, whistling, he realized that he needed to find out more about Marjorie Iverson, because he wanted her, and the best way to get what you wanted was to treat it like he did business, formulate an attack, go on the offensive, and swoop in for the takeover. Chapter 5 First on the docket, though, an assessment of exactly who he was planning on seducing. At seven in the morning, he called for one of his assistants. The three of them were on call at any hour of the day, since Rob tended to keep odd hours and was a workaholic insomniac at best. He knew they rotated the on-call phone between them so he could have someone available at all times. It rang once, and then a female voice picked up. "'Who's this?' Rob asked. He had a female assistant, but damn if he remembered her name. He tended to run through people too fast. "'This is Smith, sir.' She didn't even sound sleepy. What can I help you with? I have a date tonight, he told her, putting a hand behind his head while relaxing in bed. He stared up at the ceiling, mentally picturing Marjorie's face. Marjorie Iverson. She's staying in room 301. I want to know everything you can tell me about her in the next two hours. I'm not talking five minutes on Google, either. I'm talking grade A, private detective, get me the color of her panties shit. You understand? I understand. Smith's voice was coolly efficient. Is there a price cap on this knowledge, sir? Nope, just time. Two hours. Make it happen. He hung up, padded to the shower, got in, jerked off to the thought of honey blonde hair, endless legs, and a hint of freckles. After he dressed, Rob worked on his laptop losing himself in emails and endless spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations of ratings numbers, until his phone rang precisely two hours later. Another point in Smith's favor. She was prompt. Better than that fucking Gortham. He was going to fire that kid when they got back. He really was. He tucked his Bluetooth headset into his ear and hit receive. Talk to me. Marjorie Ingrid Iverson, Smith said. Age 24. Driver's license lists her height as six foot one, weight estimated at one hundred and fifty five pounds, blood type O positive, organ donor, date of birth is July ten, cancer star sign. Cancers are traditionally nurturing, loving, and very domestic. Parents were George and Rita Iverson. Both died in a car accident when she was aged two, and Marjorie was raised by her grandparents, John and Ingrid Iverson. Straight A student through high school attended one year of community college, and then abandoned classes when John died and Ingrid suffered a stroke. Ingrid passed one year later. Marjorie was executor of the estate and settled family debts, 
then went to work at the Rise and Shine Diner, a sock hop themed, privately owned diner in Kansas City. It is currently owned by Hawking's conglomerate, who purchased the diner earlier this year. Stop, Rob said. Let me digest. Smith was silent on the other end of the line while Rob mulled over the information fed to him. His brain had stuttered at the Hawking's name. So, his good old buddy Logan owned the diner that Marjorie worked for? There had to be a connection there. Not to mention, Marjorie had mentioned being a bridesmaid, and Logan was here for his own wedding, and, well... Well, shit, she was in the damn wedding. This would either work beautifully or be a fucking nightmare. It didn't matter. He still wanted Marjorie Iverson. Okay, Rob said after a moment. Continue. Very well, Smith said. Last year, Ms. Iverson reported an income of $28,992 on her Form W-2 from the Rise and Shine Diner. She currently has one bank account with $2,008 in her checking. Her credit score is 720, and her debt-to-income ratio is... I'm not looking to give her a damn credit card, Rob told her, irritated. I don't give a shit about that. Give me personal stuff. Is she seeing someone at the moment? Recently out of a relationship? Papers shuffled on the other end of the line. Nothing shows on any financial records in regards to cohabitation or joint paperwork filing, sir. So, basically, all you've got for me is that she's a waitress with good credit? He bit out sarcastically. That's not useful. Smith took his shitty mood in stride. I talked with a woman at the front desk, and she let it slip that one of the other bridesmaids, an Angie Stewart, is coming in at one this afternoon. Angie is also a co-worker with Marjorie. I can interview her and get additional personal information, sir. He was intrigued. Interview her? How? By lying, sir. This time, Smith sounded mischievous. A fake interview, if that's all right with you. It is. Report back. And good job. He added the last gruffly, making a mental note to give her a bonus on her next chat. Funny how he had three assistants and only one was worth a damn. He clicked the headset off and returned to work. He had meetings to attend, and his email piled up faster than he could answer it. But work let him stay busy through the day, and at least the hotel room was comfortable. The weather was gorgeous, but he'd be damned if he'd work down at the beach again. Fucking beach and fucking riptides. He shuddered at the memory. Lost in work, Rob was surprised to hear a knock at the door, precisely at two in the afternoon. His stomach growled. He'd missed lunch as usual. But he ignored his body and answered the door. Smith stood there, in her gray power suit, glasses perched on her nose, and her hair pulled back into a nondescript bun. "'Good afternoon, sir,' she said, and held out a small electronic device to him. "'What's this?' He took it and examined it looked like a recorder of some kind. I interviewed Miss Stewart and thought you would want to hear the conversation for yourself. Is there anything else I can do for you? Smart. He rubbed his jaw. Tell those other chuckleheads that I need lunch. You can have the rest of the day off. She inclined her head ever so slightly. Thank you. He shut the door and pressed play on the recorder. Two women's voices arose in conversation. It was illegal to tape someone without their knowing but he wondered if Smith knew or cared. Didn't matter, really. So, what's this for again? The woman speaking was clearly a smoker and older. Her voice had a hint of rasp to it that he recognized well. He could practically smell the menthol on her. Smith's efficient voice cut through the recording. A surprise slam book that was commissioned for the bride. We're interviewing the wedding party and asking them to tell a little bit about each other. I can't tell you much about anyone except Bronte and Marjorie. I don't know the others. That's fine, Smith soothed. Let's start with them. Tell me about Marjorie. He tensed, listening. The woman laughed, and Rob immediately got offended. Was she laughing at his Marjorie? That fucking bitch. But her next words eased his mind a little. I love Marjorie. How can you not? Hating her would be like hating puppies or flowers or something. She's a sweet kid. Rob relaxed and moved back to his chair, listening as the interview went on. Have you worked with Marjorie long? A few years. She's a favorite with a lot of the customers. Another laugh, 
Pretty much anyone over the age of eighty, they all adore her. I guess she's the grandkid they never had or something. She has a lot of regulars, and I'm pretty sure they're all geriatric. But Marge remembers all their names and their birthdays and makes them feel special. You can tell when some people are bullshitting, and she's not. She genuinely loves older people. Rob mentally noted that. All right, his Marjorie enjoyed the company of the elderly. Not a bad thing, really. But he couldn't recall the last conversation he'd had with anyone over the age of sixty. Huh? Clearly, he had a crowd different from hers. It seems that once Angie was started on the subject of Marjorie, she didn't stop. Yeah, that girl's kind of an odd one. I mean, I don't say that in a bad way. It's just that, like, okay, she goes to knitting circles and antique shows. She quilts. I mean, who fucking quilts nowadays? Marjorie, that's who. I don't think she has hobbies like normal girls her age. She's not into clubbing or sleeping around. She does crosswords and volunteers at a nursing home. She's an old lady trapped in a young lady's body. Smith supplied helpfully. That's exactly it, Angie said. An old lady. I mean, like I said, you can't help but love her. Sweet kid, built like a stork, but sweet. And it's easy to see that she's lonely. Lonely? Smith asked in a mild voice. Yeah, I think she was raised by her grandparents, right? So she's never exactly blended with normal kids. Add in the height, and I'm guessing it does a number on her self-confidence. Like I said, she doesn't have any friends other than the diner ladies under the age of eighty, and she sure doesn't date. No, nope. If I bet money, she'd be a virgin for sure. I'd say the girl's never seen a dick before, but what do I know? They both laughed, and Rob clenched the recorder in his hand. If he ever saw this Angie person, he was going to personally take her down a damn peg. Now let me tell you about Bronte. Angie continued, "You want to know someone that's lucky as hell? It's her. She's marrying a billionaire, you know." He fast-forwarded through the rest of the conversation, but it seemed to be about Bronte and not Marjorie. Disgusted, he tossed the recorder aside and drummed his fingers on his desk, thinking. All right, he knew a fair amount about his Marjorie. She was old-fashioned, a good girl, and a virgin. The last part flummoxed him a bit. Rob didn't date virgins; they weren't his type. The friend could always be wrong, but he wasn't sure about that. Girls shared that kind of information with each other, didn't they? And Marjorie had that air of innocent awkwardness that he found so intriguing, and. Different. So yeah, she was likely a virgin. Well, fuck. He didn't know how to date a virgin. He didn't even know how to begin. But he wanted Marjorie. With every ounce of his being, he wanted that girl. He craved her in inexplicable ways. Rob was a man who always went with his gut instinct, and right now it was telling him that Marjorie was the girl for him. But he was pretty sure he wouldn't be her type. He drank, he cussed, he had one-night stands, he paid girls to show their tits on TV. He was crude and rude and a loudmouth. And all the reasons that Logan Hawkins wouldn't give him the time of day would work against him with Marjorie Iverson too. Well then, Rob rubbed his jaw. He'd just have to show her that he could be the kind of guy she needed. He could behave, if he wanted to, and for Marjorie, he wanted to. Chapter Six. For the tenth time that day, Marjorie wished she'd packed more clothing. She studied her dress in the mirror and frowned. You don't think this is too, I don't know, floral? Seated on the bed, her friend Angie flipped through Marjorie's magazine and didn't even look up. Did he say formal dress or just to wear a dress? I, I don't know. My head was spinning a little. Marjorie confessed. Okay, it had been spinning more than a little. It had been whirling like a carnival ride. She'd been sleepy from the late hour as they'd returned from the pre-bachelorette party, and even though she hadn't been drinking, she was exhausted from watching the antics of Bronte, Gretchen, Maylie, 
and the newcomer, Violet. They'd taken a ferry a few islands over, and it had made poor pregnant Audrey seasick, and she remained sick all night. So Marjorie, being responsible down to her bones, had taken charge of the evening. She'd shuttled the drunks and the one sick pregnant lady, from dinner to the nightclub, and then on to the strip bar, where they'd lost all the money they'd brought, and Audrey proceeded to get sick at the table. And then Marjorie spent the rest of the evening holding a damp cloth to pour Audrey's forehead while the others partied. Still, Bronte had enjoyed herself, and that was all that mattered. Marjorie did her best to ensure that the bride had a truly wonderful time at her pre-bachelorette party, since Gretchen, as the maid of honor, was determined to drink and have just as much fun instead of running things. That was fine with Marjorie. She liked to see the others enjoying themselves. But she'd been more than a little exhausted when the cab had pulled up to the hotel, and it had stunned her to turn around and see the man she'd been daydreaming about right at her elbow. He was just as good-looking as she'd remembered, too. Handsome, with that dark hair, chiseled jaw, and those gorgeous eyes she could stare into for hours. He was also shorter than she remembered. That had been disappointing, and she'd worn heels that night, since it was just girls, and standing on the curb, she'd towered over him. Just standing next to her in heels made most men retreat. No one wanted to date a string bean, as she'd been told a million times before. But her dream guy hadn't commented on her height at all. In fact, he'd kissed her hand, charmed her figurative socks off, and invited her to dinner. And now, here she was with less than four hours of sleep, after running around with Bronte and Gretchen and the girls for additional fittings, and a last-minute change of shoes, because Audrey's feet were swelling and wouldn't fit in the Louboutins that Bronte had selected for all the women. She was now getting ready for her date. Her date. Just the thought of having a date made Marjorie's breathing speed up. She dated Olive twice while in high school and in college she'd flirted with a guy at a party who hadn't seemed to mind how tall she was. Until the next day, when he'd sobered up. He'd then gone to his friends, laughing about how he'd been so drunk that he'd made out with the flagpole. So yeah, other than that, she really didn't date. Any guy she was vaguely interested in, she was too terrified to ask out, and no one ever asked her out. Other than that one night at the frat party, she'd never even made out with a guy. Second base was as far as she'd ever gotten. It was downright embarrassing, and it made her feel like an idiot. So having a date tonight, despite the height difference of herself and the man in question, to say she was nervous was an understatement, and she didn't know what to wear. Normally she'd have gone to Bronte, who was sweet and friendly and wouldn't steer her wrong. But Bronte was wrapped up in wedding preparations, and Marjorie didn't want to bother her. So she'd gone to Angie. Angie had worked with Bronte and Marjorie at the diner for the last couple of years, and she was a nice enough lady. She was a mom, divorced three times, and a dainty southern belle with a tiny figure and big hair. Angie was utterly friendly, but around her, Marjorie always felt a bit more ungainly, more like a misfit. Still, she knew Angie dated a lot, and she knew Angie better than the other women, who were only casual acquaintances. If they teased her about her lack of dating history, she wasn't sure she could handle it, whereas Angie was just being Angie. She might say something hurtful, but Marjorie knew she didn't mean it. So Angie it was. Marjorie had called her over to her room, and then proceeded to go through her clothing, looking for something date-worthy. Since she'd pictured spending the next two weeks on the island playing shuffleboard and attending wedding functions, she'd gone for comfort more than style. Her closet was full of knit shorts, floral tank tops, and flimsy sundresses in bright patterns. In short, nothing date-appropriate. There was no point in stressing over it, though. They were on an island resort, so he'd expect her to look, well, islandy, right? She pulled a new dress out of her closet and held it against her frame. What about this one? That's terrible, Angie proclaimed. I hate to say it, sugar, but it makes your shoulders look bony. 
You're already all angles, girl. You want to look soft for him, vulnerable. Marjorie swallowed hard, feeling vaguely ashamed of her shoulders. What if I wear a shrug over it? Then you'll look like a flamingo in a sweater, Angie proclaimed, putting the magazine down. You're tall like a model. Wear something like what models wear. They always look perfect. I don't know why you can't do the same. Marjorie returns to her closet, digging through the few hangers desperately. But models are taught how to dress, or someone picks out their clothes for them. Well, that's true, Angie said. We'll make do with what we have. She looked Marjorie up and down. Even if what we have is quite a lot of girl. She resisted the urge to hunch her shoulders down to make her body seem smaller. I'd offer to loan you something of mine, but I don't think anything could stretch that much, she said, eyeing Marjorie's hips critically. Not enough fabric, you know. I know. I'm sure we can find something sufficient in my closet, right? Let's just work with what we have. What kind of guy is he? A dreamy smile touched Marjorie's mouth as she held a dress. Handsome, really handsome, and friendly. Angie waved a hand. No, no. I mean, what's he like? Is he the kind of boy you bring home to Mama after a day of church? Or is he the kind you make out with in the back of the club? Oh, Marjorie blinked, thinking. I guess he's the latter. Then that's not going to do, sugar, Angie said, pulling the dress out of Marjorie's hands. Do you want to just have a nice friendly date with this guy, or do you want him to look at you as a romantic prospect? Her cheeks heated. A romantic prospect, of course. Oh, gosh, if he didn't look at her romantically, she'd just be crushed. So crushed. Her hopes were up so high. Then, do you really think wearing something that looks like a Sunday school dress is going to get his attention? Chagrined, Marjorie looked down at the dress they'd decided on. It was subdued, a red and orange patterned sundress with a long skirt, a scoop neck, and cap sleeves. I guess not. What should I wear, then? Something with boobage, sweetie. You've got nice tiny little boobies. Show them off. She did? Marjorie consulted her wardrobe again. What about this romper? Angie nabbed a bright red swath of silky fabric. It's kind of cute, and it'll show your legs off. All right, Marjorie said. Let me find the tunic that goes under it and the leggings. Wait, tunic, leggings, what? Just wear this. Angie pushed it at her. Show some skin if you want to win your man. He's not my man, Marjorie said, blushing. And he never will be with that kind of wardrobe, Angie said in a practical voice. Now, do you want to wear something that screams virgin, or do you want to wear something that screams confident woman? Well, when she put it that way, it was a no-brainer, wasn't it? Marjorie grabbed the tunic top and went into the bathroom to change, and came out a moment later, chagrined, and plucking at the silky material. I'm not sure this is a good idea. Why? Come show me. What's wrong? Angie gestured at the full-length mirror on the far wall. Come, stand here. Marjorie did, miserable. The light, silky fabric of the tunic was loose at the collar and clearly made to be worn with a tank underneath. The collar dipped deep between her breasts, exposing her plain white bra. To make matters worse, the tunic itself was designed to be flowing and worn with leggings, so edges of the skirt only went to tall Marjorie's upper thighs. She tugged at the back, sure that her ass was hanging out. It needs layers. Angie thwapped her on the arm. It doesn't need layers, you prude. You can see my bra. You're right, she waved her hand. Take the bra off and let's look at it. What? No! Fine, fine, Angie said, throwing her hands up. You can wear this nice moo-moo and tell me all about how he didn't want to date you again. Marjorie swallowed hard and stared at her reflection. Rob was cocky, worldly. It was clear he wasn't her type. 
Heck, she was so sheltered that she wasn't even sure she had a type, which was kind of depressing. Would it really be so bad to wear a short dress out on a date? No one would see her except the guy she was trying to impress. She looked back at the dress that Angie was holding up. It was rather dowdy. With a sigh, Marge reached into the neckline of the dress and began to slip out of her bra. She tossed it on the ground a moment later, and then they both looked at her critically in the mirror again. Without the bra, her cleavage seemed to go on for miles, right on down to her belly button. She made an unhappy moan, but Angie clapped her hands. Perfect. It is? Yes. Now show me your flats. Picking shoes was a special kind of hell. Since Marjorie figured nothing could hide her towering stature, she didn't care about the height of her heels. She loved a pretty pair of shoes. They were her favorite weakness, like Angie's was costume jewelry. But they didn't see eye to eye when it came to picking footwear to go with her dress. She still had the nude Louboutins that the bridesmaids were no longer going to wear in the wedding, and that Bronte had suggested the women keep anyhow. Marge adored them, but Angie had taken one look at the stiletto heel and made unhappy noises, so she'd reluctantly put them aside for tamer wear. What about these? Marjorie held up a pair of strappy sandals with a wooden heel. They match. Goodness gracious, no, Angie said, horrified. Is that four inches? Girl, you're going to tower over him as it is. No need emphasizing the flaws. She picked up the only pair of flats Marge had brought. You need to wear these. Trust me. No one wants to date Goliath, especially not a sexy man. Great. Now she was Goliath, and full of flaws. She felt rather homely at the moment, despite all the help to make her attractive for her date. Flats it is. Thank you, Angie. Of course, sugar. She leaned in and pressed a kiss to Marjorie's cheek. Now, I promised my son that I'd spend some time at the pool and relax. Can you handle your makeup and hair without me? Marjorie eyed Angie's thick eyeliner and big bouffant hair. I'm sure I'll figure something out. You go have fun. Angie beamed at her and waved. Good luck on your date. Give me all the deets when you return. I will. Her friend beamed, then left the room. Marjorie sighed at her reflection in the mirror. Pale skin met her gaze everywhere she looked. Her boobs jiggled when she moved, and if she bent over even slightly, her butt was going to hang out of the back of the tunic. Worried, she looked over at her other dress choices. But Angie was right. They were frumpy and old-looking. She needed to be sexy if she was going to impress someone like Rob. Still, it was hard to be sexy in plain black flats when she was used to wearing heels. The flats made her feel ungainly, and she began to pull her hair up into a sleek knot. Then shook her head and let it down again. Nope, a knot would just add another inch of height. That would be bad. She combed her hair into a loose curling ponytail that lay at the nape of her neck and put on her makeup. Her stomach was doing nervous flips in her belly. It had been late last night and dark. Maybe, maybe Rob didn't see how tall she was? Not that one could miss it, but you never knew. What if he took one look at her and regretted his offer for dinner? She stared at her form in the mirror. Experimentally, she hunched down a few inches. Nope, too obvious. Nothing she could do about that. With a sigh, Marjorie straightened her shoulders and grabbed her handbag. Time to meet her date. She crossed her fingers with a silent mental plea that he wouldn't be horrified at the sight of her and that there would be no stiff breezes that would show the world her panties. Chapter 7 Rob's date was impossible to miss in the busy lobby. A full head taller than every other woman in the room, she was also the most acutely uncomfortable. Her pretty cheekbones were stained with a red too mottled to be blush, and she kept fidgeting with the impossibly low collar of her short, flimsy dress. The thing was bright red, and barely covered her ass, and it was clear that Marjorie was uncomfortable as fuck in it. It surprised him to see her in the odd choice of clothing. After all, she'd seemed shy. 
and from what her friends had said, she was old-fashioned. The woman in that dress didn't look like old-fashioned a bit. She looked like she was gunning for cock tonight, which didn't make sense. He blinked as her braless breasts swayed as she headed toward him, tugging at the hemline of her tiny blousey dress. She wasn't exactly dressed appropriately for where they were going, and her shoes were a pair of ugly black flats that made her feet look enormous. He said nothing though. With the panicked look on Marjorie's face, Rob suspected that if he said one word about her appearance, she'd flee and he'd never see her again. And that wouldn't suit his plans to get her out of his head. He raised a hand so she'd see him, and then adjusted his cufflinks as she crossed the room toward him. Tugging at her clothing, her wide-eyed gaze grew even wider at the sight of his black suit, and he watched her clutch her handbag in terror. Oh, she breathed as she approached him. Oh, I didn't know we were going someplace important. Her gaze moved over his double-breasted jacket. Oh no, should I go change? You're fine, he told her, and offered her his arm. She bit her lip in that cute way again, and shyly took his arm like he'd offered her a present. Thank you. For some reason, her obvious pleasure at that small gesture made him feel like a fucking king. He patted her hand. You look incredible, he told her. I'm glad you're here. Her eyes lit up, and once again, Rob was in love. Damn. He had it bad for this strange, sweet Amazon. I'm happy to be here with you, she told him in a soft voice. Where are we going? A little restaurant called Le Poisson. It's a few islands over. He led her to the waiting sedan and opened the door for her. How are we getting there? I hired a private boat to take us. Come on, our reservations won't keep if we take too long. The boat ride was mostly silent, with a few comments on the weather. It was clear to him that Marjorie was nervous. That was fine with him. He'd get a few drinks in her at the restaurant, and she'd loosen up. The silence allowed him to study her. She'd been so happy and carefree on the beach, and even last night. Right now, she seemed like a different person, continually tugging the dress into place as the wind whipped past and the boat flew over the waves. Her profile was gorgeous, though, and he caught himself staring, fascinated. She turned and noticed him staring, and an overbright smile curved her mouth. How about this weather, huh? That's the third time you've asked that in the last fifteen minutes. Oh, is it? She looked crestfallen. I'm so sorry. Don't be. He watched a lock of hair escape her ponytail and dance across her cheek. He wanted to touch it, but she'd probably be too skittish. You don't have to be nervous around me. She looked over at him and laughed, and for a moment he had the uncomfortable feeling that she was going to say, "But you're Robert Cannon, billionaire and TV mogul, and my one-way ticket to Sugar Daddyville. Of course I'm nervous." But instead, she said. Do you realize I haven't been on a date in two years? His mouth curled into a reluctant smile. Of course, Marjorie was exactly who she seemed. He was just nervous over nothing. That's so. Marjorie leaned in, tucking her arms close to her body. Believe it or not, I don't get asked out much. Now I choose not to believe that, Rob said. But he felt a possessive streak of pleasure at her words. I'm afraid it's true," she said with an expressive sigh. "You're the first man with enough courage to ask me out in a long, long time." He snorted, enjoying the banter. "There's no courage involved in asking a pretty girl out." "There is if she can beat you in basketball," Marjorie teased. "I find that hard to believe," he scoffed. Why was she putting herself down? So she was tall. He dated models all the time, and they were tall. Maybe not as tall as her, but who cared? He didn't. I play a mean round of hoops. Do you? She looked interested. 
I played in high school until some of the parents got upset. We weren't a big enough school for co-ed teams, so I played with the boys. I was pretty good though when I did play. At least I was once I figured out the secret advantage. Secret advantage? Boobs. Seems the boys were afraid to guard me once I grew boobs. He threw his head back and laughed. Her smile was pleased, easy now. It's true. They didn't know where to grab me, and so I could make it all the way down the court in no time. Why do you think the parents wrote and complained? Because they were shit, er, not nice people. Damn. He probably shouldn't cuss around her. She was a sheltered virgin, right? So his normal foul-mouthed conversation was probably a no-go. He eyed the cleavage she was currently trying to tug her clothing over. The night was a windy one, and her nipples were visible through the thin fabric. And if he was going to be a gentleman, he wasn't going to stare at them. God damn it! No matter how much he wanted to reach over and touch them. Well, that too. Marjorie said, drawing his attention back to the conversation. He forced himself to meet her gaze and couldn't remember exactly what they were talking about. She glanced around as the boat sped through the dark waters and hunched over a little, crossing her arms over her breasts. You cold? He moved to take his jacket off and offer it to her. Not cold. He studied her. Trying not to look down at those enticing and too obvious breasts. You sure? You seem uncomfortable. She gave him a shy smile. I'm not dressed all that nice for a dinner date. Not like you. She licked her lips nervously as she studied his suit, and he wanted to taste that darting tongue. I didn't bring anything dressy to the island. You look fine. Don't worry about it. It was he that should be feeling all out of sorts. He was in a goddamn suit with goddamn cufflinks for Christ's sakes. But he'd dressed up for his date with Marjorie, sure that she wouldn't want to go out with a guy who tended to wear a slobby t-shirt and jeans to four-star restaurants. Right now, he felt a bit like a fucking show pony, which was a bit ironic, considering that Marjorie practically had her tits hanging out of her dress. Not that he was complaining about that part; it just didn't seem virginal. That's all. Then again, in his line of work, he didn't exactly fall over a lot of virgins. Maybe this was just how they all dressed nowadays. She glanced around as if seeking something to talk about, then looked back at him. Her eyes were full of amusement. This boat must have been expensive to charter for just two people. Maybe it was. He had no idea. He didn't really look at price tags any more. You know, you didn't have to get this just to impress me. I would have been just as happy eating dinner at one of the resort restaurants. He wouldn't have been though. With his luck, Logan would show up, and he didn't want anything interfering with his date with his cute blonde Amazon. Now that he had her to himself, don't tell me how easy a date you are. Or I'm going to end up disappointed if this date ends with anything less than your legs wrapped around my face. Of course, that's what normal Rob would have said. Nice, dateable Rob said, "Don't be silly. I wanted to treat you." Man, dateable Rob was such a bland putz. He hoped Marjorie appreciated him, though. She was smiling, though, and leaning over so much that her tits were about to pop out of that flimsy dress. Christ! It took everything he had to keep eye contact with her. So, do you date a lot, Rob? It should have been a coy question, but Marjorie's wide-open gaze told him that she was serious, and she probably wouldn't like the answer. It was on the tip of his tongue to tell her that he could snap his fingers and get more pussy than a regular man could ever dream of, but she was watching him with that earnest expression. And Rob realized that he was probably just as rusty at dating as she was. The girls he normally dated, they approached and propositioned, and he let some of them fuck him in exchange for getting on TV or getting into an exclusive party. That wasn't really dating. Dating was spending time with someone that you were interested in.
to learn more about them. He sure as shit didn't want to learn anything about the parade of disposable tits and ass that were readily available. So he said, Yeah, I guess I'm pretty out of practice, too. She leaned in, and he got another glimpse of those gorgeous shoulders and a hint of cleavage. I won't hold it against you. Will your thighs hold it against me, that is? But Bland Rob smiled and said, Why, thank you. Chapter 8 The boat ride ended far too soon, and they made it to Le Poisson, a ritzy little restaurant near the docks of a neighboring island. Chinese paper lanterns lined the docks, and white tablecloths tables lined the patio, and there was the faint sound of live music from inside. As they walked into the restaurant, he watched her visibly tense, and her hands went to hold her short, floppy skirt down. He'd known that was coming. Le Poisson was a black-tie sort of place, and she was wildly underdressed. Still, if she acted like she owned her look, no one would think anything of it. But judging from her hunched shoulders and unhappy expression, that was too much to hope for. Rob put a hand to the small of her back in solidarity and guided her forward. No backing out now. Marjorie looked over at him, startled. Oh, I wouldn't. That'd be rude. And I want to be here with you. Her smile grew over bright, and he wondered if that was Marjorie's version of flirting. It was awfully toothy. And was rudeness the only reason she wasn't backing out of this date? Damn. His ego had just taken a massive beating at the thought. He guided her inside. The entryway to the restaurant was crowded with waiting people, but Rob Cannon never waited. He kept his hand firmly on Marjorie's back and pushed forward. At the sight of him, the maitre d' nodded and grabbed two menus. He led them to a small private corner of the restaurant, the white tablecloth lit in the center by an antique bubble glass lantern. Nearby, several couples moved on the dance floor. Everyone looked in their direction, and he felt Marjorie shrink a little more. He wondered if she had any idea yet as to who she was dating, or if she was getting an inkling, thanks to the quick service of the maitre d', who knew how to deal with celebrities. Nah, she probably thought everyone was staring at her skimpy dress, though she probably wouldn't be wrong on that aspect, either. Rob caught a flash of black panties as Marjorie sat down in the chair he pulled out for her. The maitre d' handed them menus, talking about the name of their waiter and the specials for the day, but Rob wasn't listening. He was watching Marjorie's face. She stared up at the man, rapt, as if he were reciting poetry to her instead of fish specials. When he finally left the damn table, Marjorie looked over at Rob and gave him a hesitant smile, and then opened her menu. Her eyes widened, and she immediately slammed it shut again. Something wrong? Rob asked. She leaned forward, the menu pressing against her breasts in a rather delicious way. Did you see the prices here? No. He flipped open the menu and scanned it, looking for something outrageous. What's wrong? They're charging fifteen dollars for a house salad. She looked scandalized. He chuckled. Wait until you see the wine list. But this time, she didn't smile. If anything, she looked more uncomfortable. A waiter stopped by and put down two crystalline glasses of water. Welcome to Le Poisson. My name is Aubrey, and I'll be your waiter tonight. Shall we start with a nice vintage? We have a bottle of 2008 Didier d'Agneau Silic Sauvignon Blanc that has a lovely grapefruit scent. It makes the perfect complement to seafood. And, he guessed, it was the most expensive bottle they had on hand at the moment, since they were in the VIP section. He shrugged. He preferred his alcohol hard, but wine seemed more civilized. Wine? he asked Marjorie. She hesitated a moment, thinking. He could practically see the wheels turning on her face, and he expected her to decline. Maybe she didn't drink. But she nodded, her eyes wide again. Wine sounds good. Bring the bottle, Rob told him. We'll take it. Very good, Aubrey the waiter said, and disappeared. Rob sipped his water, 
Now there was a fucking novelty, and watched Marjorie reopen the menu and skim the pages quietly. You're looking for the cheapest thing, aren't you? She looked up, startled, and then gave him a sheepish glance. That obvious? I'm paying, so order what you like, even if it's the filet mignon. He gave her a teasing wag of his eyebrows. To his surprise, her face turned a mottled red, and she licked her lips nervously. Rob, I... Ah, oh, hell. He'd let douchey Rob out of the bag again, hadn't he? It was a tease, nothing more. I'm sorry if it alarmed you. Christ, now he was apologizing for cracking jokes? Were his nuts in a sling? But she continued to look uncomfortable, so he added, You should know that I expect nothing out of this date, except possibly a second date. Her smile brightened. I think I can handle that. He put his hand on the table, palm up, and inviting her to put her hand into his. Trust me. Marjorie gave him a shy look and put her hand in his. I do trust you. Those were rare words for him, he had to admit. Trust Rob Cannon? Normally he'd be laughed out the door. But this girl with her big eyes and her tall body and the breasts that were practically falling out of her ridiculous dress? He wanted her to trust him. Rob squeezed her hand and then ran his thumb across her palm, enjoying her little jerk of response. I'm glad, Marjorie. Call me Marge. Everyone does. Dear God, he was dating a Marge. That was fucking horrible. Must I? It made him think of cigarettes and Ben Gay. You're a Marjorie to me, which is beautiful. She gave a happy wiggle in her seat, which made her unbound breasts bounce. And, dear God, it was painful to keep eye contact and not leer at the tits just begging for his attention. But somehow, miraculously, he did it. God, being dull Rob sucked. But Marjorie kept smiling at him, which somehow made it worth it. All right, then. Robert. He winced. Robert Cannon was his business name, and he had started to hate every time he heard the second syllable of his name. I prefer Rob. It's what close friends call me. All right. Her smile grew broader, her hand flexing against his as he ran his thumb over her palm again. She had the most delightful full-body shiver every time he did that, so he was going to keep right on doing it. What's your last name? He hesitated for a moment. Did she want it because she was going to Google him? Or was it simply an innocent question? He had no idea, but he figured he might as well throw it all out there. Cannon. She merely looked thoughtful. It suits you. It does? Was this sexual innuendo? He'd heard them all before, and they were usually fucking awful. Rob's packing a cannon. Fire a shot over my prow, Rob. Do me in the poop deck. But he'd never heard innuendo come out of such an innocent-looking face. I think so. It sounds strong and fierce. Yeah. Christ, she really had no idea who she was dating, did she? Why did he find her innocence so fucking adorable? What's your last name again? Iverson, Norwegian ancestors, hence the height, she grimaced. There's nothing wrong with your height. She didn't look convinced, but he noticed she tactfully changed the subject. So, your friends call you Rob? Sweetie, I don't have many friends. I'm not your sweetie. Ah, a spine. So there was one under there after all. He liked a bit of sass in the right girl. Fair enough. I apologize. She nodded. Don't apologize. Cupcake. Just don't do it again. He laughed. She pulled her hand from his, and he was a little disappointed at the loss of contact. Marjorie picked up the menu and studied it again, her shoulders relaxing a bit. 
I don't suppose you're going to just let me order a nice bowl of soup? Nope. It'll go sh- Er, badly with a really expensive wine. She looked unhappy. Can I pay for my own dinner? Do I look like a cheap piece of- Uh, do I look cheap to you? Fuck, this no cussing thing was hard. She lifted one eyebrow at him, her serious expression ruined by the silly grin on her face, and he found himself smiling in return. I suppose I shouldn't ask that. Probably not, she teased. They paused as the waiter returned, and Rob ordered for both of them, a surf and turf special so she wouldn't protest the price. She looked mildly unhappy at the thought of spending so much money, but said nothing. When the waiter left, she leaned in again. So, Mr. Cannon... Rob, he said warningly. Rob, she amended. Are you here for the wedding or vacationing? It was clear she had no idea who he was. He liked that to think that he might get to know a girl like Marjorie without the inevitable turning up of her nose once she found out what he did for a living. One thing was for sure, she was damn sheltered if she didn't, though. He... They paused as the waiter gave them a spiel as he brought out the wine and showed the bottle to them. Rob barely paid attention, watching Marjorie's rapt face as the waiter told her about the vintage and the flavor and poured her a glass swirling it as he handed it to her. To his surprise, Marjorie downed the entire inch in the glass. She coughed and put a hand to her mouth, then pressed her napkin to her lips. Are you all right? Rob asked. She continued to cough and waved a hand. Wrong pipe. He sipped his wine and gave the waiter a nod. Thank you. We'll take it from here. The man gave him a concerned look but nodded and walked away, no doubt to laugh about Rob's date swilling her taster. Rob poured her another inch into her wine glass. Do you enjoy wine, Marjorie? Oh, sure. I drink it all the time, she told him. A uh, connoisseur? What kind is your favorite? She blinked and then pointed at her glass, eyes watering. This one. Right. Somehow he doubted that. She gave him a big smile and picked up her glass again, taking another big gulp as if to prove her point, and choking only a little this time. It was a little ridiculous, but also a little adorable, so Rob didn't comment on it. The waiter returned a minute later, put down their salads, then disappeared again. When he was gone, Rob picked up his flatware, and tried to turn the conversation back to the original topic. A wedding? He feigned ignorance. She nodded. Bronte and Logan? I guess if I have to tell you, that means no, right? Her mouth quirked in a rueful smile, and she reached for the wine, taking another sip. I'm not here for the wedding, he admitted truthfully. Are you? You are looking at bridesmaid number four out of five. Just as he'd suspected, Rob wanted to groan in frustration. If Logan knew that Rob was out on a date with one of the bridesmaids in the wedding, after their little talk, he'd think Rob was up to no good. And he couldn't blame him for that, not after hinting of blackmail to the man. He'd definitely have to keep his relationship with Marjorie on the down low. Because he definitely intended on having a relationship. Bridesmaiding, huh? Sounds like fun, he lied. It's pretty awful, she admitted, which made him laugh again. I'm not a fan of attention as it is, and Bronte's marrying a guy that seems to be a pretty big deal. I'm told this will be in the society papers and everything. She shuddered. Add that with a bridesmaid's dress that seems to accentuate my height, and I'm in my own sort of quiet hell. So why not tell the bride to fuck? Uh, tell her that you're not interested. She gave him a vaguely reproachful look. Because she's my friend, and she asked. I couldn't refuse. The wedding isn't about me, anyhow. It's about her. And it's not such a big sacrifice, really. 
I got a few weeks off of work and an all-expenses-paid vacation, so it's not so bad. And Bronte is wonderful, truly one of the best people I've ever met. Her expression grew soft with affection. I adore her. He grunted, smearing his lettuce. Hearing her go on rhapsodically about Logan's sainted bride made him think that if Logan found Rob still at the resort, he was going to get booted out on his ass. And wouldn't the paparazzi love that? He could see the headline now. Tits or GTFO? The Man Channel's billionaire owner must not have listened. Yeah, fuck that noise. Uh, listen, Marjorie, I... He paused, staring at her. She was gazing at something just to his left, her fork halfway lifted to her pretty pink lips, which were currently parted. She kept blinking, the look on her face incredulous. So he couldn't help it. He looked over. At the next table over, two women sat gazing in his direction. It was clear they recognized him, based on the lascivious looks they were shooting in his direction. As he looked over... The brunette grabbed her blonde friend, and they began to kiss and make out in a very obvious display. Lipstick smeared on their mouths as they tongued each other, both of them looking at him, and one played with the spaghetti strap of the other, hinting that she'd take the top off if he'd only ask. It happened to him all the time. Tits or GTFO was their biggest show and a bit of a legend. It was a game show in that they'd show up someplace public, and offer a hot girl money to go topless. She either had to show her tits or GTFO, and there were plenty of girls who were willing to take his money, enough that they'd never have to show a single fucking rerun. Wherever he went, women tried to get his attention, and most flirty women knew that the best way to get a man's attention was to coyly make out with the woman next to her. Every dick in a room stopped for two chicks making out, after all. Rob rolled his eyes at their antics and glanced over at his date. Judging from Marjorie's shock, she had no idea what had prompted this action. He leaned in, trying to distract her. Island girls are pretty forward, huh? She looked over at him, and her mouth closed. She nodded and put her fork down. I'll say. My goodness gracious. Twin spots of color flagged her cheeks, and she grabbed the glass of wine and chugged it again. He was about to tease Marjorie that her exclamation sounded like something his grandmother would say when someone walked up to the table. Oh, hell. Rob looked up in vague annoyance to see the forward brunette standing at his side. Her red lipstick was smeared on her wet mouth, and up close, her lips looked overplumped and injected with too much silicone. Just wanted to drop this off, she said in a breathy voice sliding a slip of paper with her phone number, or room number, depending on how forward she really was, toward his hand. She winked at him. See you later, hopefully. And she sauntered off, her hips swaying. God damn it, couldn't a man eat his meal without being interrupted? He chewed angrily on a mouthful of lettuce, ignoring Marjorie's shocked stare. Did you know her? she asked. Her words were slightly slurred. Surely she couldn't be drunk off of one glass of wine, could she? Nope, I can honestly say I've never met that girl. Hundreds like her, yes. That one in particular, no. Is that her phone number? She asked in a low, hurt voice. As he watched, she took another gulp of wine. A droplet or two ran off the corners of her mouth and landed on her cleavage. He stared at those beads of glistening liquid, then shook himself. Fuck. This date was turning into a hot mess. He had to save this. He didn't want the girl that had just left. Chicks like her were a dime a dozen. He wanted the one across from him. The one that couldn't hide what she was thinking if her life depended on it. The one that was currently getting drunk off of expensive wine because she was so nervous. So... He grabbed his napkin and pried the lid off of the lantern at the table, revealing the small candle and flame within. He took the girl's number without unfolding the paper and fed it to the candle. Marjorie gave him a hesitant, confused smile. 
Boy, they really are forward, aren't they? Indeed. By the time they got to dessert, Rob's date was plastered. Marjorie had downed half of the bottle of wine and was currently staring at him with a dopey, glassy-eyed expression, her chin resting on her fists. The angle of her arms made her small tits sit right on the tabletop, and the deep cleavage of her dress made them practically spill out. And still, Rob didn't look. Christ, it was hard being a gentleman. He even glared at their waiter when he hovered over Marjorie for too long, daring the man to take one look in that direction, and he'd get no tip whatsoever. So what are you thinking, Marjorie? That silly smile on her face grew wider. That you're so pretty. He gave her a faint smile. That so? Yeah, she said dreamily, gazing at him. I never dated anyone quite so pretty as you. He was going to retort that men weren't really pretty, but the conversation was heading in a much more interesting direction. And do you date a lot? he asked. All the time, she said, and then shook her head, contradicting her words. He frowned. He understood a girl getting a little drunk on a date, especially if she was as nervous as Marjorie. But she was past tipsy and well into plastered. You want to eat some bread or something? Nope, I'm good. She reached for her wine again. He reached over and switched her glass to water. The rest of the dinner was a mess in Rob's opinion. They chatted and laughed about simple, easy topics, like the weather, the resort, and the size of the portions of the overpriced but tasty food. Sometimes, Marjorie was cute as a button. She'd laugh at all his jokes, throw in a few corny ones of her own, and then would ruin it by chugging more wine. It was baffling. It was frustrating, too, because there were glimmers of greatness in their date, only to be ruined by drunken giggling or a dopey glazed look from his date. And Rob dealt with enough drunks in his day-to-day -day work. He sure didn't want his date acting like one. So he rushed them through dinner, hoping it'd stop her from drinking so much wine, and practically snatched the bill up when it came time to pay. She reached for it, too. We should go have these. I'm not a cheap fuck. She gave him a prim look, and then giggled into her wine. I can pay my own. Yeah, right. He knew how much she made a year. Again, I'm not a cheap fuck. All right, she said, smiling happily over her glass of wine. Just do me a favor and tip him well. He did a good job, and they're short-handed. That observation surprised him. How can you tell? She nodded as the waiter sailed past them, carrying a pitcher of water. He's got two sections, and the other one's clear across the restaurant. He's having to hustle tonight, so I'm guessing that he's covering for someone. She gave him a little smile. I told you I was a waitress, right? Nope, you didn't. His assistant had told him that, though. Yeah, nothing fancy here, she shrugged. Been meaning to go back to college, but I took a semester off and just never went back. Rob glanced down at the thirty-dollar tip he'd left and added a two in front of it on the receipt, then showed it to Marjorie. That okay? He expected her to protest, being so incredibly stingy when it came to the food. But her eyes lit up, and she positively beamed at him, regarding him like he was a fucking hero. That's so wonderful, Rob. You'll make his night worth it. If that's the look I get, I'll add another digit in front of it, he said, taking the receipt back. Laughing, she smacked his hand. Don't! He nodded at the nearby dance floor. Now that we've eaten, want to dance a little? To his surprise, the open expression on her face cooled, and she shook her head. Why not? She'd been giving the dance floor little covert glances all throughout dinner, and he figured most women love to dance. I'm not totally fu- uh, terrible, just mostly terrible. 
she smiled. It's not you, it's me. She pushed a leg up one side of the table. I'll tower over you. People stare. That was all it was. Let them stare. But when she shook her head again and crossed her arms over her chest, he wondered about her ugly shoes. The night she'd gotten out of the cab with her friends, she'd been wearing a pair of classy high heels. Tonight with him, she was wearing ugly black flats. Is that why you're wearing those shoes? So you aren't quite so tall? She licked her lips and said nothing. So you're tall. So fucking what? Her eyes widened. He mentally cursed himself for slipping a four-letter word in there. What I meant to say was that it's not a big deal. I'm taller than most men. I'm smarter than most men. You think that's bringing me down? She just gave him a look. You're an Amazon, he agreed. There's no hiding that. The look on her face grew hurt, and he had a vague feeling like he'd kicked a puppy. Let me tell you something, he said, leaning in. If they have a problem with you being taller than your date, that's their issue, not yours. Your legs are gorgeous, and they look amazing in heels, and I'm a selfish enough guy to insist that you wear something that makes you look great. And if you're taller than me, so what? I'm secure enough in my masculinity to not give a... a... Hell, he couldn't think of something that wasn't vulgar. Give a fuck? Give a shit? Give a rat's ass? Darn, she supplied. Yes, darn. I don't give a darn. His mouth curved. Now, will you please come dance? It wasn't like he was fucking dying to dance. Hell, he was a dude. He hated dancing. But the opportunity to press Marjorie against him and see those long legs moving in that short skirt... He was totally on board for that. Well, alrighty then, she said happily. Let's dance. She got to her feet, nearly knocked the table over as she stood, and Rob reached out to help her. You okay? I'm great, she enthused, her face flushed. He wasn't so sure about that, but they headed to the dance floor, Rob's arm anchoring around Marjorie's waist. In flats... She was pretty much the same height as him, and he liked that. The music changed to a slow, sultry song, and Marjorie's arms went around his neck, her loose breasts pressing against his chest. And Rob forgot all about not staring, because her tits were small and sweet and pushed up against him, and how could he not look down? Are you having fun? he murmured as they began to sway to the music. A lot of fun she said in that slurred, breathless voice. Her gaze fixed on his mouth, and she leaned in. Can we kiss? As much as he wanted to, he shook his head. You're pretty drunk, Marjorie. She shook her head violently. I'm not, and her knees sagged. Whoa, I think the floor moved. He groaned and hauled her against him. Stand up, Marjorie. You're drunk. She giggled and clung to him, staggering. It's breezy in here. People were staring at them, and Rob checked her dress. Covered up on top, but the bottom had slid up. Fucking perfect. He tugged it back down for her, and then looked for the closest chair to deposit her in, since she was no longer even trying to stand up straight. The bar was only a few feet away, so he hauled her there and planted her on a stool. Stay here, he told her. I'll go get your purse. Marjorie giggled and made a big show of pointing at the bar. Right here. It made her top slide down one arm, her breasts nearly falling out. He adjusted her clothing, trying not to feel exasperated. This night was turning into a fucking disaster. Just stay here, okay? I'll be two minutes. He hustled back across the restaurant, looking for their table. To his dismay, it had already been cleared, and Marjorie's purse was nowhere to be seen. He looked for the waiter instead. Naturally, he was nowhere to be found. Rob waited a few minutes, impatient, and then when he still didn't show up, he flagged down another waiter. I need my date's things, he told the man. Where's my goddamn server? The man looked startled. 
What section are you in? When Rob showed him, he nodded. He's on break right now. Then go fucking find him, Rob gritted. Right goddamn now. Of course. The waiter disappeared, and eventually Rob's waiter was located, the purse retrieved. He headed back toward the bar, hoping that Marjorie hadn't fallen asleep waiting for him. She hadn't. She was leaning close to a guy at the bar, who was looking down the front of her dress, and giggling as she tossed back a shot. Furious, Rob stormed over. Marjorie, what are you doing? She turned around on the bar stool and beamed at him, all cleavage and drunken smiles. I am doing shots with this lovely gentleman. She patted the man on the arm. He's so nice, and he bought them for me. You shouldn't be doing shots, Rob told her. Not after all that wine. Lay off, man, the guy said, and slid her another shot. She's just having a little fun. Jimmy, she said. This is my date, Rob. Isn't he pretty? Jimmy looked him up and down. Nope, you're more my type, darling. Not your darling, she said merrily, before swigging the next shot. She coughed as soon as it went down. Ugh, that one was rough. What was it? Tequila, Jimmy answered. Marjorie, come on, Rob said. Hell and fuck. Why was he being the one all responsible and shit? But the way Jimmy was eyeing Marjorie made him want to punch the fucker's lights out, and Marjorie was too tipsy to realize it was a bad idea to take drinks from strangers. You really shouldn't be doing shots. It's okay, she told him. Liquor after beer, never fear. It's liquor before beer, Rob corrected, putting a possessive hand on Marjorie's back. And you can't handle your alcohol either way. We should return. Jimmy stood up, all five foot three of him, and sneered at Rob. The lady can do what she wants, friend. She ain't married to you. You want to make this a fight? Rob asked, getting in the smaller man's face. Oh, he was just itching for a fight. Brawling was something that he excelled at. A low erp made both men pause. Rob turned back to look at Marjorie, who had her hands clenched firmly on the woodlip of the bar. Her face had gone pale and sweaty, and she blinked at Rob. I don't feel so good. Then she turned and vomited at his feet. Chapter 9 It was a long fucking boat ride back. Marjorie puked all the way from the restaurant back to the boat. She spent the entire ride back to Sea Turtle Cay with her head over the railing violently ill. When they made it back to the island, she was so exhausted from puking that she did little more than curl up in the back seat of the taxi and dry heave, her head in his lap. And even Rob, who wasn't the most sympathetic of people, even on a good day, felt sorry for her. He stroked her hair while she wept and heaved and generally made a mess wherever she went. By the time they got back to the lobby of the Sea Turtle K Resort, they were both exhausted. Marjorie had fallen asleep, and so Rob carried her inside. Her body was long, but her form was light, and it was no trouble to haul her up the steps. First stop, the front desk, to get a key for Marjorie's room. He knew the room number, but his date was asleep. If he woke her up to get the card, he suspected the vomiting would start again, and neither of them wanted that. Right now, she was mostly at peace her nose pressed against his neck, her breathing soft and exhausted. So, front desk. Of course, as soon as they got into the hotel, Fate stepped in and shat on his plans. Chit-chatting at the front with the desk attendant was the obnoxious redhead she'd been partying with a few nights ago. No doubt she was part of the bridal party and would run straight to Logan if she saw Rob hauling around an unconscious and thoroughly drunk Marjorie. All right, change of plans. They'd go to his room. Rob maneuvered down the opposite hall, away from the front desk, and headed for the elevators. 
He held his breath until the damn thing opened, and then hammered the buttons as soon as he stepped inside. Close, close, damn it. For once, luck was on his side. The doors closed without incident, and the elevator chugged up to his floor. He juggled the sleeping Marjorie while he swiped his key card across the pad and then headed into his suite. Someone had come in and cleaned while he was gone. That was good. If she woke up surrounded in candy bar wrappers and empty beer bottles, she'd probably panic. Instead, the suite was perfection once more. The bed was freshly made, his dirty clothes no longer littering the floor. All the food wrappers that had covered his desk were gone, and his laptop was closed. He headed over to the bed and gently laid her on top of the blankets on one side, then tugged them out from under her dead weight and covered her with them. Her dress collar was off to one side, and he was pretty sure her entire boob was exposed. But she was sleeping and sloppy drunk, and it wasn't a turn-on in the slightest. He covered her with the blankets, tucking them tight around her, and when she mumbled and turned on her side, he went and grabbed the ice bucket and put it next to the bed, just in case. Then, pulling an extra blanket out of the closet, he headed over to the sofa in the main room of his suite and stripped out of his now-vomited-on clothing. What a fucking disaster tonight had been. Nights like this were a good reminder of why he didn't date. Marjorie was dying. That was the only possible explanation for how awful she felt. Death. Possibly hers, though her mouth tasted like something had crawled in there and died as well. She licked her dry lips, and immediately her stomach protested. Oh, oh no. She bolted up from the bed and ran for the closest door, barely making it before her stomach heaved up its contents. She puked for what felt like forever, crouching against the side of the toilet bowl, and whimpered when nothing else came up. God, this was awful, so awful. Her head felt like it had split open, and her entire body ached. Everything was vague and fuzzy. Was she sick? What was wrong with her? The toilet felt nice against her cheek, though. She rested her face against the side of it for a moment longer, and then peered at the black lumps of clothing tossed on the floor that she'd just now noticed. Men's shoes. A belt. Slacks. A jacket. Oh. Oh, dear. Eyes wide with horror, Marjorie looked around at the bathroom. This wasn't hers. Her room was really nice, but this bathroom was bigger than hers, and someone had used the deluxe waterfall shower in the past few hours and had discarded towels on the tile, something she never did. Where was she? Stumbling to her feet, Marjorie gazed at the bathroom counter. Shaving implements. Shaving? She caught a look at herself in the mirror and moaned in horror. Her eye makeup was now under her eyes instead of above them. Her hair was a disaster and her face was a sickly shade. Her neckline had shifted, and one of her breasts was falling out of her dress, the other about to join it. Quickly, she fixed things. There were dried streaks around the corners of her mouth, and she hurriedly washed her face and smoothed her hair. Then she threw up again, because her stomach hated all that moving. As she clung to the toilet once more, she tried to recall exactly what had happened last night. It was a blur. She remembered going out with Rob, sort of, and she remembered drinking a lot of wine to try to seem worldly to him, and she vaguely remembered a dance floor, and puking, lots and lots of puking. Okay, okay. She breathed deep to settle her stomach and tried to calm her racing mind. She'd clearly gotten drunk. And now she was back at his place. There had to be a logical reason for that. Did she sleep with him then? Was she no longer a virgin? Good Lord, had she had sex and couldn't even remember it? Her hand went under her skirt. Her panties were still there, in place. The crotch wasn't even damp. Even her shoes were still on. All right. Probably no sex then. She'd probably been too sick. 
The panic in her chest lessened, and she spent a few more minutes with the toilet before her stomach felt comfortable enough for her to stand again. She had to get back to her room, pronto. Marjorie tiptoed out of the bathroom and rubbed her eyes, looking around at the suite. It was luxurious, the size of the room probably bigger than her apartment at home. Thick carpet muffled her footsteps, and she made the bed as best as she could, grabbed the ice bucket in case she got sick again, and then headed into the main living area of the suite. As she opened the door, she spotted a big male body sprawled on the couch, a blanket on his hips, and little else. Rob slept, his hair tousled, his chest bare. Oh, sweet mercy, he was pretty. Unable to help herself, Marjorie drew closer to him. She couldn't help staring. Any woman would. Rob had a gorgeous chest, all hard muscle. His pectorals were fuzzed with darker hair that trailed down to his belly button and continued below the blanket. His face was relaxed in sleep, a hint of beard shadow on his jaw. And his mouth? Gosh. His mouth was a soft bow that seemed perfect for kissing his date. She wondered if he'd kissed her last night. Her breath seemed to indicate no. But maybe he had before things went south. She wondered how it went, and she kept staring at the happy trail that went under that blanket. He continued to sleep soundly, one arm across his chest, the other thrown back over his head. He wasn't holding down the blanket, not at all, and a terribly naughty thought occurred to her. Biting her lip, Marjorie clutched the ice bucket in one hand. Her other reached out for the blanket itself. He wasn't wearing a shirt while he slept, and the feet that poked out of the other end of the blanket were bare, too. Was he completely bare under the blanket? Curiosity got the better of her, and she leaned over him, watching to see if he stirred. But he was still fast asleep, so she lifted the blanket. Rob was totally naked. Oh, Gosh, just wow. So that was the first penis she'd ever seen outside of what was on television or the Internet. And it was kind of impressive. The length of him lay across one thigh, hard, the head a darker shade than the rest of his skin. She could see a few veins tracing the length and followed them with her eyes down to the curls of his sacks and his balls. Huh. She stared for a good long minute more, mentally measuring him. Weren't guys supposed to be a certain length? She forgot what the average was, but Rob was longer than her hand, unless she missed her guess. She thought about putting her hand next to his penis to compare the two, but she didn't want to wake him. Reluctantly, she eased the blanket back down and then tiptoed away from his bed and out the door. Well, well, well. Rob forced himself to remain still, his breathing as even as possible, as Marjorie tiptoed out of his suite. He'd been awake ever since she'd crawled out of bed, but he hadn't wanted to startle her, so he'd feigned sleep. She hadn't had the slightest clue that he was awake, and she'd ogled him. More importantly, she'd ogled his dick. Once the door closed... He opened his eyes, a smile curving his mouth. He glanced under the blankets himself. His dick was hard, and getting harder by the minute, which should have clued any other woman in that he was awake. Not his virgin, though. She'd stared her fill and then retreated. He wondered what she thought of things. Whistling, Rob tucked both hands behind his head and relaxed rather pleased with this sudden turn of events. After last night's disaster, he'd wondered if dating her was a bad call. As much as he'd wanted her, it was hard to come back from being puked on all night. Still, he was feeling pretty happy about things this morning. He'd give Marjorie a few hours to sleep off the worst of her hangover, and then he'd call her and ask her out for date number two. Someplace, he decided 
with no alcohol. Chapter 10 Rob waited until afternoon, and then he texted Marjorie's phone. You dead? Her response came a few minutes later. Feel like it. He laughed. Couldn't help it. She wasn't even pretending that she was fine, which was kind of adorable. He decided to skip the texting and called her instead. Mm, hello? Marjorie's voice was husky, blurred with sleep. Glad to see you survived last night. God damn, he sounded cheerful. Regular fucking sunshine right over here. Surviving is debatable, she said. My head feels like it wants to abdicate from the rest of my body. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you mix wine with the hard stuff. Never again, she moaned. Never ever again. Eat some crackers and drink some water, he told her. I'd tell you hair of the dog, but I don't know if your stomach could handle it. Crackers, got it. She sighed heavily. Now to find some crackers. I'll have the front desk run some up to you. Or one of his assistants. Don't get out of bed, just rest. You're an angel, she said in a soft voice. I'm so, so sorry about last night. I really don't know what came over me. It's all right. I still had a good time, though his best time was this morning, when she peeked at his junk. You were entertaining, he said, teasing her. I don't remember. No, time for some fun. I especially liked the part when you flashed the bartender in exchange for a free drink. She was utterly silent on the other end of the line. Marjorie? Yes. Her voice was small. That was a joke. Her moan of relief was audible, followed by a giggle, and then another moan. Please don't make me laugh. It hurts. He snorted. You still on for date number two? You sure you want to go out with me again? She sounded surprised. I do. Which should have surprised him, too. But he kept thinking about that curious peak from this morning. That little action trumped any amount of vomit. We'll go someplace low-key. Wear jeans, and I promise there will be no alcohol. I think I can handle that, she said. If you're sure. More than sure, he told her, amused. Where are we going, then? It's a surprise. Because he honestly had no idea. Okay, then. See you in the lobby. Just let me know what time. Will do. He hung up, thoughtful. Where could he take her? They did dinner, and it had turned out terribly. Not to the fucking beach. He still had nightmares about that shit. It had to be some place that one of her other friends wouldn't run into her. Just because Marjorie didn't know who he was didn't mean the others didn't. He wanted to avoid that conversation for as long as possible long enough to show Marjorie that he was a good, wholesome guy. Or at least pretending to be one. Last night was a dud. She didn't remember much of the evening, so he'd have to start fresh tonight. A movie? Too cliché. He was still pondering things hours later, as his afternoon meeting with his assistants rolled around. His suite had an adjoining room with a table that functioned as an office, and they filed in with notepads and binders in hand, ready to discuss the prior evening's ratings and their current to-do list of projects. Rob wasn't all that interested, though. Things would run themselves for another day. So when they sat down, he turned and gazed at the three of them, thinking, If you were dating someone and you wanted to take them somewhere low-key, where would you go? Somewhere fun, not a movie. I want to actually be able to talk to my fucking date. Gortham's mouth opened and then snapped shut again. He looked bewildered and shot a glance at Cresson. Date, sir? Cresson asked. Fucking save him from incompetent assistance. Rob rubbed his forehead. Did I fucking stutter? Date. D-A-T-E. Me and a woman. I'm taking her out, and it has to be some place that Hawkins won't run into us, because I don't want him mucking up the works. Now, ideas? Cresson's brow wrinkled. 
He tapped his pen on his notebook. Dinner? Not dinner. Dinner was a bad call. Dancing? Gortham asked. That kid was so asking to get fired. Not fucking dancing. Something else. Smith watched him with her pale eyes. Rob nodded in her direction. Any ideas? Bingo, sir? Bingo? Smith nodded. The resort operates a bingo session every night in one of the dining rooms. Hawkins is probably not spending the week before his wedding playing bingo, so you're safe there. And if Miss Iverson is used to spending her time with the elderly, it's probably a good guess that she enjoys bingo. Bingo, Rob repeated. My mother plays, Smith told him. She also knits. Bingo sounds like a winner, he told them, and pointed at Smith. Remind me to give you a raise when we get home. Her smile was pleased. I'll remember, sir. Okay, Rob said, rubbing his hands together. Now I need to figure out what I should wear to bingo. Chapter 11 So, how did your date go, honey? Agnes asked Marjorie as they lounged poolside. Marjorie tucked her floppy hat even lower on her head. Even with sunglasses and a straw hat, there was still entirely too much sunlight around. Not so good. Oh, no! What happened? Edna sounded so disappointed. Marjorie told them what she could recall of the evening. She skipped the part where she'd woken up in his room, though. Some things just didn't need sharing. Edna and Agnes gave her sympathetic looks. Oh, sweetie, maybe you don't drink on first dates in the future, Edna said, with a little pat on her hand. You want to impress him, not scare him. I know, Marjorie said glumly. The iced tea in her hand was helping to keep her hydrated, but not doing much for the headache that wasn't going away. I really messed up last night. I just wanted to seem sophisticated, you know? And I ruined it by puking everywhere. Humiliated didn't even begin to cover how she felt today. Hangover notwithstanding, the awful, awful realization that she'd tossed her cookies repeatedly in front of the sexy guy she was trying to impress. Nightmarish. She'd just been so very uncomfortable. Rob had looked suave and dangerous in his dark suit, so out of her league. Add in the fact that her clothing had never seemed to stay in place, and she had taken whatever liquid courage that wine could offer. And then some, she thought with a groan. Gosh, she was never drinking ever again. Ever, ever, underlined and signed. Well, that's not how you impress a man, Agnes said with a sniff. I've got a lot of men over the years, and I never did it by getting drunk. It's true, Edna said. Agnes is a terrific flirt. You could learn a lot from her. Marjorie peered over her glasses at Agnes. Really? I've never been good at flirting. I never know what I should be doing. What do you do? Edna tittered. What doesn't she do? Agnes just chuckled and pretended to fan herself. Curious, Marjorie waved a hand at Agnes. Go on, fess up. I want to know. She really liked Rob, and she wanted to be a success dating him. She wanted to be someone that he would want to know. She had a pretty good idea that being herself wouldn't do it for a guy as sophisticated-seeming as him. She needed to up her game. And if Agnes had a game, Marjorie wanted to copy it. Well, Agnes said in a coy voice, you start with the basics. Wear something that tells him you're interested. Marjorie blanched. I think I have that part covered, because she hadn't had any of her parts covered last night. What else? You touch his arm when you talk, Agnes said with a nod, and leaned forward and touched Marjorie's arm. It creates a private moment between the two of you. Ooh, that's good, Marjorie said, eyes widening. Arm touches. She could do that. Tell me more. 
Men like to feel needed, and they like to feel smart. Agnes said smugly, "You want to impress him. Laugh at everything he says, even if it's not funny. Just act like he's the wittiest, most entertaining man you've ever met." She nodded at Edna. "Come on, try me." Edna cleared her throat and then assumed a gruff voice in imitation of a man's voice. "You look very well today, Agnes." Agnes leaned forward and gave a sultry chuckle, touching Edna's arm. You sweet thing! It was amazing that she still managed to make it sound sexy, despite the rasp of a heavy smoker's voice. Edna continued in her man's voice. Isn't the weather nice today? Again, Agnes tittered in a flirty manner. <laughs> What? Did you bring me out on a date so we could talk about the weather? Marjorie's eyes widened. Wow. See, Agnes told her. Bobbing her head so fiercely that her neck gave a bit of a wobble, you hang off of him and act like every word is gold. He'll be so crazy over you that he won't know which way to turn. I believe it, Marjorie said. I wonder if I should write these down. No, no, it has to be natural. Just practice before your next date. Agnes snapped her fingers. Oh, and I nearly forgot the most important thing. What's that? Marjorie leaned forward, rapt. Surely there weren't more hints about to be tossed her way. She had already learned so much just from watching Agnes in action. Act like you don't know anything. Marjorie's brows furrowed. Huh? But Agnes gave her a wide look, her penciled-on eyebrows raising knowingly. That's right. If he talks about cars, you don't know anything about them. But I don't know anything about cars, and if he talks about the weather, you don't know anything about the weather. And if he talks about running a diner or anything that you do know a lot about, you don't know anything about it. Understand me? I, I guess so. I just wonder why. Because a man that is in control is a happy man, Agnes said. Trust me. You should. Edna told Marjorie, "She knows what she's doing. She's had six husbands." Well, if that wasn't an indicator of success, Marjorie didn't know what was. Rob texted her at five that afternoon and asked her to meet him in the lobby at seven forty-five. She texted back her confirmation and then immediately dashed to her closet, looking for something to wear. Tight clothing, Agnes had advised. Marjorie pursed her lips and considered her limited vacation wardrobe. She'd brought things appropriate to the wedding, and she'd considered shopping today for her next date. But her hangover had nixed that idea. She settled on skinny jeans under a blousey white shirt with big ruffled sleeves and a plunging neckline, and wore a tank top underneath. It wasn't super sexy, but she tucked the tank into her jeans and ensured that it showed a lot of cleavage. It could be worse, she supposed. She considered her flats, but they'd been part of puke fest, and she'd tossed them. All her other shoes were extremely tall. Oh well, there was nothing to be done about that, was there? If he liked her pukey, maybe he'd like her tall too. She wore the nude Louboutins since they were her current favorite and made her feel sexy. Once her makeup and hair were done, she ate an entire handful of breath mints, fixed her lip gloss, and then took a deep, fortifying, minty breath. All right, date number two couldn't possibly be any worse than date number one, could it? With a quick knock on wood, just to ensure that she didn't jinx herself, Marjorie headed down to the lobby to meet her date. Once again. Rob's date was easily noticed when she cut through the lobby, and once again she took his breath away with how utterly fucking gorgeous she was. How did men not notice her? How had she remained such a sheltered virgin for so very long? It was a baffling mystery. So she was tall. What did that matter? She was spellbindingly gorgeous, and as she strolled toward him. He couldn't help staring at the long, slim legs, perfectly set off by the pair of fuck-me heels and her loose blouse. Her hair was pulled into a knot 
high on her head, and small tendrils escaped around her brow and ears. As she spotted him, she gave him a shy smile and ducked her head as if embarrassed. It took everything he had not to grab her by the hand, drag her back to his hotel room, and throw her down on the bed and fuck her until morning. Christ, just the sight of her made his mouth water and his dick hard. As she approached, she put her arms out. This okay for where we're going tonight? It's perfect. Rob said, hating the hoarse note in his voice. He cleared his throat again. You look great, Marjorie. To his surprise, she leaned forward, touched his arm, and gave a wild giggle. <laughs> Thank you, but, uh, uh, how about this weather? Huh? It's great, I guess. She trilled a laugh. Oh, Rob, you're so funny. Tell me more about the weather. His brows drew together. Had she moved on from alcohol straight to acid before tonight's date? Because she was acting a little bizarre. There's clouds and sometimes rain. She continued to giggle, but the look in her eyes was nervous. Why, um, that's right. Right. He smoothed the front of his vest, a fucking sweater vest. God, he'd be laughed out of the Man Channel offices if they saw him dressed like this. But he'd asked his assistants to pick out something appropriate to wear on a bingo date, and this was what they'd decided on. He looked like a fucking chump, but Marjorie was smiling at him, so he supposed he looked all right in her eyes. How you feeling? She giggled again, but this time it sounded even more forced. Couldn't be better. Really? You look a little pale. Marjorie touched her cheek, her expression crestfallen. I do? Yeah, great. He'd just told his girl she looked like shit. Way to be smooth, Rob. She'd just totally derailed him with that bizarre weather babble. Don't worry about it. So, where are we going? Something I hope you'll like he said, offering her his arm. Bingo night. She stumbled in those high heels. D- Did you say bingo? Really? Her voice went up a squeaky notch. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun. Much like getting a root canal was fun. You ever play? Me? Her eyes went wide. Oh, um, no, actually... I haven't. She gave another inane giggle. Then she reached out and touched his arm again. Seriously, what was with her? They headed toward the conference room, set aside for the nighttime bingo. The room was filling up, and sure enough, the average age looked to be above fifty-five, maybe more. He could have sworn that someone waved at Marjorie, but she grabbed his arm and steered him to the front. Let's sit right up here, shall we? So we can learn. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's easy to figure out, he told her, letting her drag him over to the table. They call a number and you mark it down. She gave another wildly fake laugh, touched his arm, and her eyes were wide with that manic look. You're so smart. I'm sure you'll have to do my cards for me. I'm terrible at this sort of thing. Behind him, he was pretty sure someone snorted. Ain't that Marge? said one voice. Before he could turn around and question the man, Marjorie touched his arm again. Could you go get me a drink, please? That would be so wonderful, and all this bingo has made me thirsty. She patted her throat as if to demonstrate. Uh, we haven't even started yet, but okay. He got up and headed to the concession stand set up at the back of the room. As he did... He glanced over his shoulder and saw Marjorie gesticulating at the people behind them. What the hell was going on? He paid for two bottled sodas and headed back to see Marjorie smoothing paper cards on the table in front of them. He offered her one of the drinks, and she looked up. She held a piece of paper out to him. I bought cards so we can play. I hope that's okay? Sure. 
And I got you a marker. You can be blue, and I'll be pink. She handed him a little blue bottle with a wet sponge on the end, and she touched his arm again. That was starting to weird him out. It really was. They sat in awkward silence while the tables filled and everyone waited for the caller to sit down. This should have been the time to have a great, fun conversation with Marjorie, but he was afraid she'd keep doing that weird touch and giggle thing. This whole evening was turning into a bust too. How fucking depressing was that? He'd even worn a sweater vest for this shit, all for nothing. Frustration mounted, and he was relieved when the caller finally sat down. This first game will be a blackout, the caller announced. You must cover the entire card. I'll call the first number, B ten. The room fell silent. Next to him, Marjorie marked her card. He scanned his too, but didn't see the number. Christ, there was nothing more boring than bingo. O seventy five. Which one of his assistants had suggested bingo? They were fired. This was like watching paint dry. The next few numbers were called in a droning voice. He daubed at each number on his card and glanced over at Marjorie. She was busy marking her card and then looked over at him and gave him a tentative smile. Having fun? A blast, he said in a flat voice. She faltered. And then reached over and marked a number on his card. He looked at her in surprise, and she pointed at the screen. It's in the hopper. The hopper? There was a screen. I thought you didn't know how to play. Oh, she said, and her eyes went falsely wide. I don't. How do we win this one? Was she trying to be stupid? It's called blackout. I think it's pretty obvious. Another crazy giggle erupted from her. Of course, she reached over and touched his arm again. A pink smear from her bottle showed on his gray sleeve. Oh dear, he was getting a fucking headache. Can you stop touching me for five fa, uh, freaking seconds, please? Marjorie flinched backward, and he felt as if he'd kicked a goddamn puppy. Of course. And stop looking at me like that," he snapped. Her eyes got suspiciously shiny, and she stared down at her card while the caller droned another number over the microphone. He should apologize. He really should. Not that he was good at apologizing, but he should at least try, right? Rob heaved a sigh and then put his marker down, turning toward her. Look, Marjorie, maybe we should call this off. Tonight just isn't working for me. She abruptly stood up from the table. I have to use the bathroom. Her pink marker bottle rolled onto the ground, and he automatically bent over to get it for her. When he sat up, though, she wasn't heading for the restroom at all, but the exit, and she was running. Well, fuck. Maybe he shouldn't have started his apology that way. Rob rubbed his face. And then was annoyed to see a blue streak on his hand from his own marker bottle. God damn it! You're a prick," a raspy voice said behind him. "What the fuck?" He turned around and stared at the old geezer who was glaring at him. The man sat next to two older ladies, and they all looked utterly pissed at him. "Who the fuck are you?" "Someone who knows how to talk to a lady," the old man said, raising his chin. "Unlike you." Prick. The two ladies next to the man shot him dismissive looks between marking numbers on their cards. I have gone out of my way to make that girl happy, Rob began, but the older guy shook his bingo marker at him again. Doesn't look like it to me. Looks like all you can do is make her cry. Make her cry? Oh fuck! Rob got up. Now he did feel like a dick. She was crying. The old man shot him the bird. All right, whatever. He gave the man his card and bottle and headed out the door Marjorie had run through. The resort was a big place, but apparently it wasn't too hard to find an extremely tall, upset woman. After a few minutes of asking, people directed him outside the hotel toward the beach. Of course, it would be the goddamn beach, wouldn't it? 
With a sigh, Rob headed in that direction. Fucking water. Fucking island. This trip had been a mess ever since he'd stepped off the plane. Maybe he should have just cut his losses and gone home. Despite this depressing mindset, he found himself following the path out to the beach and began to walk down the shore. In the distance, he could see a small, huddled figure sitting alone in the sand. Rob's steps picked up, and as he approached, he saw it was definitely Marjorie. She hugged her knees, her face buried against them, and her shoulders shook with silent tears. Her high heels were discarded in the sand nearby, and the waves lapped a scant few inches from her bare feet. Ah, oh, hell. Why was she being so goddamn sensitive about this? Rob gazed at her for a long moment, trying to decide what to do. She hadn't noticed him there. Then, with an inward sigh, he sat down on the beach next to her and looked out at the dark, murky water. It looked rather ominous at night. He had a brief mental vision of Marjorie holding him under the water and drowning him for hurting her feelings. She looked up as he sat down and flinched away. What? Why are you here? Hell if I know. Rob stared out at the waves. Marjorie swiped at her cheeks, and he heard a loud sniff, but he didn't look over. Better to give her time to compose herself. He sucked at handling tears. Most of the time they were just used to try to get sympathy, and he had no sympathy to give. But seeing smiling, happy Marjorie crying made him feel... Well, it sure as shit didn't feel good. You should know. I wasn't trying to be critical, Rob began. I'm just... He sighed. I don't know. I was kind of hoping this would go better than it did. She sniffed again. I'm sorry. He glanced over. Why are you apologizing? Her cheeks gleamed in the moonlight, and her eyes looked swollen. Shit. She looked terrible, all woebegone and miserable, and he felt so damn bad that he immediately regretted coming out here. It seemed that puppies, good ratings, and weepy Amazons were his weaknesses, and wasn't that just ducky? I'm just, you know, an idiot. She wiped at her face again. I'm not good at impressing people. He snorted at that his lips twitching into a reluctant smile. You were trying to impress me? She nodded, her expression woeful. I'm pretty rotten at it, huh? Well, it wasn't good, he agreed. Is that what all the arm touching was for, and the laughing? Was it obvious? I wasn't sure what you were doing. Thought you were on drugs at first. I don't normally drink, either. No shit! She batted at his arm with one hand, but she was smiling now. Gosh, you must think I'm such a fool. Nah, he laughed. Okay, actually some of it was pretty fucking ridiculous. She threw a handful of sand at him. Aren't you supposed to make me feel better about this if I confess my sins? You got the wrong guy for that, he said, ducking away from the flying sand. But thank God all of that was just to impress me. You are acting weird as shit. Marjorie stuck her tongue out at him. Careful, he teased. I might bite that. Immediately the tongue went back into her mouth, and he couldn't stop grinning. God, sitting here and having a real talk with her was so much better than the last two dates. Since we're coming clean, Rob said, tugging at his sweater vest. This isn't me. I'm a t-shirt and jeans kind of guy, and I cuss like a fucking sailor. He tore the sweater vest off over his head and flung it into the ocean. So, I guess we both tried to be something we're not. Looks like we're both ridiculous, Marjorie agreed. I don't know jack shit about bingo, either. I do, she confessed with a small, cheeky little grin. You're not very good at it. You were missing half of your numbers. That's because some nut kept touching my arm, he retorted. Marjorie laughed. She laughed hard and clutched her sides, rolling onto the sand. 
Oh, my goodness, what a nightmare! I can't believe you wanted to go out again. He had, because he remembered this about her these brief glimpses of pure sweetness and no pretense. The Marjorie who brayed with laughter when she truly found something funny, who had a mischievous smile, and who didn't bat an eye when he threw F bombs her way. I guess we can just keep tallying up my ridiculousness, huh? When she smiled, he leaned closer to her. I don't like to dance, either. She gave a small sigh. Neither do I. That surprised him. Really? I thought you liked it. Marjorie wiggled her sandy toes at him. No, everyone stares at me when I stand up as it is. Why would I want to go out and perform in front of them? She gestured at her heels. The only reason I wore these tonight was because the other shoes had been puked on. She grimaced and looked over at him. I really am a terrible date. You want to know what I think? I'm not sure. She gave him a faint smile, but her tone was nervous. I think, Ra began slowly, that you have beautiful long legs, and that they look fucking fantastic in a pair of high heels, and if they make you feel good, you should wear them. I'll tower over my date. Any man who's not secure enough to be seen with a gorgeous woman who just happens to be taller than him doesn't deserve the aforementioned gorgeous woman. He can go fuck himself. Her eyes widened, and a shocked little giggle, a genuine giggle, escaped her. I think you should wear the fucking tallest shoes you can find, Rop said, warming to his topic. I don't give a rat's ass if they make you eight feet tall, if you feel like a goddamn goddess in them because I imagine you'd look like one. I don't know about that. I do, he said bluntly. I've been having erotic dreams about your long legs over my shoulders and a pair of fuck-me heels, so just because it's not every man's fantasy doesn't mean that it's not mine. Marjorie's eyes were round in the moonlight. Too crude? A sorry. Actually, no, fuck that. I'm not sorry. This is who I really am. He kicked at the sweater vest that kept washing up against his ankles. I'm not this pansy little fucker. I'm just an average guy with a filthy mouth and filthy daydreams. I'm probably ruining any fantasies of yours. No, she said softly. You're not. Huh. You like a guy that talks dirty to you? She shook her head. I like a guy that's real and a little flawed. It makes me feel better about my flaws. You were just so utterly perfect that I felt like I couldn't possibly be good enough for you. He snorted. Perfect? Him? You have a strange idea of perfect, sweetheart. She nudged him with her shoulder. When had they drifted to sitting so close together? But now they were inches apart. Not your sweetheart, she reminded him in a pleasant voice. Not yet. Marjorie sucked in a breath and looked over at him, her eyes heavily lidded. It was obvious she'd liked that comment. Her gaze strayed to his mouth, and God, he wanted to fucking kiss her in that moment. Virgin, his mind reminded him. Go slow, you cocksucking fool, or she really will run away. So he just nudged her shoulder again. I like you because you're different from most girls. I liked that you didn't seem fake. Marjorie gave an unhappy sigh and stared out at the water again, the moment broken. And then I spend the next two dates being fake. Drunk and then fake, he corrected. But it's okay. I wasn't exactly Prince fucking charming myself. She gave him a wary little smile. An idea hit and Rob jumped on it. Let's start over. He got to his feet, took two steps forward, and immediately plopped down in the surf. It was only ankle high, but it took everything he had to lie in the goddamn water without panicking. He pretended to make a snow angel and called out, Help! Help! I think I'm drowning! Marjorie's peals of laughter were utterly gratifying. You're nuts! she called out to him. 
I may be so, but I'm going to drown in another minute, he told her. The water was fucking cold, and his dick was threatening to crawl back inside his stomach cavity. But it'd be worth it if she took the bait and came to give him mouth to mouth. If only someone could save me. Her laughter was downright musical, he decided. As he continued to make an ass of himself, she crawled over to him, fucking crawled, which made his dick hard despite the icy water, and hauled him backward a foot or so into the sand. There, you are now officially rescued, sir. Damn it, he wanted that kiss. But if she was missing his signals, maybe he needed to let it go. You saved me, he joked. How can I ever repay you? Why, take me dancing, she told him in a merry voice. I promise to vomit all over your shoes and mine. Rob threw back his head and laughed, delighted at her sense of humor. This was Marjorie, not the simpering girl from earlier. This was the woman he'd wanted from the moment he'd laid his eyes on her. Everything she said just convinced him even more that she was right for him. She nudged his shoulder, still grinning down at him. You should probably get up out of the water, she told him. I think someone's coming. He glanced down the beach, and sure enough, two shapes were heading in this direction. It was a couple, holding hands and walking. And as he squinted, he could just barely make out who it was. Logan goddamn Hawkins and his soon-to-be bride. Ah, shit. If they saw him here on the beach with Marjorie, everything would be over. Logan's people would swoop in and hide Marjorie away from him, and he'd never see her again. She'd have her ears filled with what a horrible fucking person he was, and how she was better off avoiding scum like him. He had to come up with something, quick. Something to distract the couple heading toward them before they made it any closer. Something to distract Marjorie before she realized just who was approaching. Luckily for him, she still leaned over him, smiling, her focus entirely on him and not the people heading in their direction. He only had seconds to figure something out. So he did the only thing that came to mind. I'm pretty sure this wasn't how it went last time you saved me, Rob murmured to Marjorie. If I recall, it went a little something like this. And he grabbed her and hauled her down against him pressing her mouth against his. She gave a startled little squeak of surprise as their mouths touched, but then went silent. He felt her body stiffen against his, but Rob imagined that was just the shock of his sudden kiss. Cold water rushed over them as the tide swept in, but Rob kept his mouth locked against Marjorie's unyielding one. Damn, she even kissed like a virgin. He had to make this kiss last at least long enough that Logan and his bride would see them making out on the beach and hopefully turn away. The darkness could hide the rest. So Rob continued to kiss Marjorie's firm, awkward mouth. He pressed soft little kisses against her lips, sucking lightly at the lower one to encourage her to open up. Her mouth softened under his, and he touched his tongue to the seam of her mouth to see how she'd respond to that. And to his surprise, she opened up for him, and her hesitant tongue touched his own. Suddenly, the kiss changed from being a disguise to being a kiss for its own sake. Rob dragged a sandy hand through her hair, pinning her against him, and began to deepen the kiss, sweeping his tongue into her mouth to see how she'd react to that. She shivered against him, but she didn't pull away and he felt his cock grow hard in response. Her tongue touched his again, a hesitant, shy caress, and he stroked it with his own tongue, coaxing her to continue. Those tiny, awkward touches from her were doing more for his dick than the last ten girls he'd fucked. When she made that soft sound in her throat as he tongued her again, he nearly fucking lost control. With a groan of his own, Rob rolled their bodies on the beach, and then Marjorie was underneath him, her back on the sand, and he was pressing her down onto the beach. His knee moved instinctively between hers, and he felt her shift against him. All the while, her lips clung to his, 
and her tongue continued to sweetly brush and flick against his own. He wanted to touch her everywhere, to drag her back to his hotel room, strip her out of the wet clothing, and run his tongue all over her skin, until she was making more of those soft noises in her throat. What would she sound like when he put his mouth on her pussy? He couldn't wait to find out. His hand strayed to the waist of her jeans, testing her, and immediately her hand covered his, stopping him. Not yet. Okay. He'd take that. For now. They were on a beach. Rob lifted his head and pressed one last kiss to her now swollen lips. He glanced around but the beach was now deserted. Logan and his woman had likely seen them making out and steered clear, just as he'd planned. Perfect. He leaned down and kissed Marjorie again, his entire focus on her once more. Come back to my room with me. Her hands pressed to his chest in a subtle refusal. Rob. She licked her lips, making them even wetter and the sight of her tasting him made him even more aroused. I... I'm not very experienced. I'm a virgin. She said this like it was the end of the world, a depressing fact to be conveyed before intercourse. He'd heard much worse, though. Things like, You should know I have herpes, and I'm still with my ex. Things that made his dick shrivel and made him send the girl packing. This? He didn't care. I'll try not to hold it against you, he told her, leaning in for another kiss. She pushed at his chest again. Rob, Marjorie said softly, wait. He waited. I'd love for us to start over, she said softly. But I think you should know the truth about me, all the truth. I'm a virgin. I've only dated two guys, and... I've never been further than second base. She called it second base still? Okay, that was kind of cute. I'm willing to tutor, he told her, leaning in to kiss the tip of her adorably freckled nose. Yes, but... She bit her lip again. Since I've waited so long, I think I want to wait until I'm in love. That's no problem. I'll just make you fall in love with me. Her eyes widened, and she thwapped his arm with her hand again. That's not how it works. Rob grinned down at her. Isn't it? You're setting your boundaries. I'm fine with that. I'd rather you tell me your hard limits now than me find out when my dick is an inch from sinking inside you. Her scandalized little gasp told him she was picturing that, too. Here's my confession. I don't know if I can love anyone, Marjorie. I'm a jaded fuck, and it takes a lot to impress me anymore. But I've been fucking crazy over you since the day you dragged me out of the water and put your mouth on me, and I'm determined to make you just as crazy about me as I am about you. And if you're fine with that, then I'd love to see you again. The real you, not the one you think you need to be. She shifted under him gazed up at him with a slight frown on her face. Are you telling me that you want to still go out with me, thinking that you'll somehow convince me to sleep with you? He thought about that, then shrugged. Pretty much. Marjorie laughed again. Wow, this is an honest conversation. I'm not promising anything, Rob said, gazing down at her. There was a bit of sand on her cheek and he brushed it off, then caressed her jaw, enjoying the simple pleasure of being able to touch her. I'm definitely not promising anything after two terrible dates, but I like you and I want you, and I think we should take it day by day. Her smile softened a bit more. I think I can handle that, and my nuts are fucking freezing on this beach. She laughed again. I'm pretty cold, too. Should we call it a night? Only if you'll promise to see me again tomorrow, he told her. Tomorrow, she gave a small shake of her head. I have lunch with the bride and another fitting. Exactly when is this wedding? A week from today. 
We're just all here early as an all-expenses-paid vacation and to help Bronte out with any wedding stuff that she might need help with. I think it's so she doesn't have a nervous breakdown over place cards or something. Marjorie fiddled with the front of his shirt. She's really stressed. The guy she's marrying is super rich and super important, and Bronte's afraid she'll mess something up. He didn't blame her. Logan seems like a real dick. Your wedding fitting can't take all day, neither can lunch. Should be plenty of time for me somewhere in there. Somewhere, she agreed, a bit breathless. Want me to text you? Letting her call the shots? Hell, why not? Sure, but if you don't text me by three in the afternoon, I'm going to think you stood me up. I would never. And I'll send you dick pics. Her laughter echoed across the quiet beach, so happy and carefree that he found himself laughing, too. That evening, when Rob went back to his room, he turned on the shower, undressed, and climbed in so he could jerk off. His cock was hard as a rock after his little aborted date with Marjorie, so it hadn't gone so great in the beginning. That didn't matter. What was important was that little talk on the beach afterward, and their kiss. Good God, that kiss. He couldn't get it out of his mind, the soft, dazed expression she'd had as he'd dipped his tongue into her mouth, the feel of her long, slim body pressed against him, the way she'd licked her wet, swollen lips and made them gleam in the moonlight. God damn. He squirted a handful of conditioner into his palm and began to work his cock. One hand braced against the wall. It didn't matter that she'd told him that she wouldn't sleep with someone if she didn't love him. She'd come around to seeing things his way, and in the meantime, there were kisses and more dates to be had. He had a week to romance the hell out of Marjorie Iverson, virgin. His cock gave an aching throb as he continued to stroke his conditioner-greased palm up and down his length. Marjorie was a virgin, and she was shy, but she was also eager. He'd seen the way she'd licked her lips and then looked back up at him. She'd wanted to keep going. He'd let her make all the first moves, of course, but until then, he had his hand. And so, he pictured Marjorie in a variety of ways, up against the wall of the shower with him, clinging to his back as he drove into her, under him on the bed tall shoes making her impossibly long legs even longer, Marjorie tonguing his cock with those wet, wet lips, Marjorie's mouth nibbling on his sack. He shot his load in record time, but it didn't help. When he went to bed that night, he was still semi-hard just thinking about her. Marjorie might be dazed with the flush of infatuation, but Rob was a jaded piece of shit. He didn't get infatuated. What he was feeling for her right now, Rob was in love, insta-fucking love. Who'd have thought that he'd be one to get all sappy over a chick the moment he saw her? All he knew was that polka-dotted swimsuits had suddenly gotten extremely fucking sexy to him. Chapter 12 The next day, Rob was feeling pretty damn pleased with himself, all things considered. The date had been a disaster, but afterward, yeah, afterward was good, and this morning, he was feeling even fucking better. Things were looking up. He sat on the balcony of his suite, enjoying a tequila sunrise and the cool breeze that rolled off the ocean. There was breakfast on his plate, but he wasn't hungry. Instead, like a spider, he sat in his web and managed his prey. First on the list, a to-do left over from last night. He texted his assistant, Gortham, since he was on Rob's shit list at the moment. His conversation with Marjorie last night had spurred more than a few thoughts, and this one was about shoes. He'd sent an assistant on the task. Have you found a maid to bribe? At woman at room 311, Gortham sent back. You can kint on me to get it, no warriors. Jesus fucking Christ, was that even English? 
He did not want this shit fucked up by some pimple-faced shithead who took a job as his assistant because he thought it got him free travel and free snatch. He texted back furiously. First of all, it's room 301, and if you don't start sending me texts and complete sentences, you're fucking fired. Got it? Got it. Good. I want that answer from room 301 in five minutes. Yes, sir. He gulped down his drink, impatiently waiting for an answer. Just when he was about to lose his shit, his phone buzzed with an incoming text. Maid found. She went in the room, said the woman wears a size 11 shoe. Rob rubbed his unshaven jaw. That sounded about right. A woman as tall as Marjorie would have long feet, too. Good. Okay, he texted back. Now, I want you to charter a helicopter out to the nearest designer shoe store and look for a size 11 stiletto heel. We're talking tall and sexy, and expensive. It needs to be all three, and it needs to be back here by four o'clock this afternoon. Get me? I'm on it, boss. Good. One issue down. Rob mentally pictured Marjorie, tall, luscious Marjorie, with the legs that went on for light years, in a pair of strappy heels, and felt the need to rub his groin. God, she'd be pretty like that. Would her eyes light up with pleasure at the sight of the shoes? His lust-filled mind provided images of him fucking Marjorie on his bed, her shoes digging into his ass, and he gave his dick another thoughtful rub. Ironic that he was so fucked up over a freckled Amazon. She did things to him that all the silicone titties in Hollywood didn't. Speaking of, he decided he'd text her, too. You awake? The response was slow in coming. I am. Well, he didn't get much out of that. Not even a smiley face? You have a good night, he sent back. Sleep well? Yes. I thought about you last night, he sent to her. Jerked off three times. What? Joke. Oh. Okay, so much for phone flirting. Don't suppose you want to send me a selfie to make my day better? I don't know how to use the camera on this thing. How did she not know how to use the camera? He thought all girls did. Every woman he'd ever dated sent endless streams of pictures of herself. Strange. But he was starting to learn that nothing Marjorie did seemed to be like other women. Maybe that was why he was attracted to her. Her uniqueness. So he sent back, I'm just fucking with you, trying to make you blush. It's working, she sent back, accompanied with a smiley face. Ah, his kingdom for a smiley face. Strange how one stupid emoticon could turn a man's morning around. Smiling to himself, he held up his glass. One of his assistants plucked it from his hand and went to get him a refill, as he contemplated what else to send to sweet, blushing Marjorie. He wanted in her pants before the week was out, and that'd be a long time for him, really. Normally, he bedded his conquests by the end of the first date, second if she was holding out. Of course, he never really went back for another date. What was the point once you saw what the girl had to offer? It was mercenary of him, but Rob didn't normally stop to think about other people's feelings. Hell, if he did... He'd never have a show called Tits or GTFO. Actually, most of the programming on the Man Channel would be a bust. And Rob liked money. He liked money a lot more than he liked most people. The assistant, Cresson, returned with his drink. Rob tasted it, grimaced at the strength of the tequila, and drank it anyway. We hear anything from Logan Hawkins yet? No, sir, Cresson said. Shall I call down to the front desk and check on things again? Do that. Rob had mulled over his shitty run-in with Logan at the bar a few days ago, and had come to the conclusion that only spitters were quitters, and he'd be a dumbass if he didn't try to reach out to Logan again. They were both here. They both had a mutual interest in money. And Rob was sure that if he could just get Logan to see his point of view, they could make a lot of money together. He'd had his assistants order a massive gift basket and send it to Logan and his new bride-to-be, along with another request for a few minutes of Logan's time. That was early this morning, 
and since it was nearing noon, he was bound to get an answer sooner or later. Rob checked his phone, but no more texts from cute Marjorie. Either she was busy or a shitty texter. He'd have to ask her about it tonight when he saw her. Speaking of... We still on for tonight, he sent. We are, she sent back a few minutes later. Meet you at five. Well, if she wasn't the most cheery texter, at least she used complete sentences. He could work with that. The glass double door to the balcony opened, and Crescent came back, an unhappy expression on his face. That was never a good sign. What is it? Rob asked. Mr. Hawkins left a message for you down at the desk, Crescent said, holding out a trifolded piece of paper. Rob took it from him, flipped it open, and read... Mr. Cannon, I regret that I am too busy to entertain business consultations with you. Please be aware that I have taken the liberty of letting the front desk know that you will be leaving today and your suite will be paid in full as a thank you for the thoughtful gift. Sincerely, Logan Hawkins. Fuck! Rob wadded up the piece of paper and threw it over the balcony. That fucking cocksucking stuck-up asshole! What is it? Crescent asked taking a step backward. We've been fucking tossed out of the hotel, Rob sneered. He's booting us and disguising it as a favor to me. So we're leaving today? Rob drummed his fingers on his mouth furiously. There was no way he was leaving today. Not with his date scheduled for later tonight with Marjorie. Not when he hadn't got what he came for. Clearly, Logan wasn't receptive to pleasant overtures. He'd just have to get vicious. We're not leaving, he said after a long moment. Go downstairs and check us out of this room. Then tell Gortham that when he gets back, I want him to get me another suite under a different name. I don't care what name, just as long as Hawkins doesn't realize I'm still here. And then get my other assistant. He snapped his fingers, trying to think. What's her name? Smith, Crescent supplied helpfully. He pointed at Crescent in thanks. Smith. Yes, get Smith to call the tits or GTFO people and get them on the first flight out here. His smile was cruel. If Logan thinks my being here is fucking up his wedding, he hasn't seen a thing yet. It was officially time to misbehave. Chapter 13 Still in a hazy, dreamlike state of contentment, Marjorie floated from breakfast the next morning to shuffleboard to a late lunch scheduled with Bronte, the bride-to-be. Her body was present, but her mind was still on that moonlit beach last night, when Rob pressed his mouth to hers and told her that he desired her. Actually, he'd said it with a lot more F-bombs, but she didn't care. He could use all the cuss words he wanted, as long as he kissed her like that and made her feel so incredibly beautiful. She'd never had a moment like that, ever. And Rob still liked her, even after she'd thrown up on him, made a spectacle of herself on their first date, and acted strangely on the second date. He still wanted to see more of her. She'd done everything possible to mess the dates up, and he'd still come after her. Marjorie's heart felt full to bursting at the thought. Rob said he wasn't capable of love. That was too bad, because she was half in love with him already. He might not think of himself as a kind man, but his actions toward her had spoken differently. He might have a tough, cuss-laden outer shell, but there was a tender heart beating underneath. She was still on cloud nine as she wandered into the green dining hall. Bronte had asked to meet there instead of the cute sea turtle cake cafe, and Marjorie scanned the empty room looking for her friend. Bronte was at a back table a small figure hunched over a mountain of cream-colored envelopes. Ron? Marjorie called, moving forward. A head rose from behind the hill of envelopes. Bronte's loose curls were pulled into a bun atop her head, and dark rings smudged the skin under her eyes. She waved Marjorie over, a smile on her face. Hey, Marge. Thanks for meeting me here. I hope it's not a problem if we have someone bring lunch to us instead of going to lunch. No, that's fine, Marjorie said, curious as she sat across from Bronte at one of the round tables. 
stack upon stack of thick parchment envelopes covered the table. At the other end, Bronte scribbled something on a card, then tucked it into an envelope and stamped it with a wax seal. What's all this? Oh! Bronte looked up from the envelope and tossed it into a small pile of sealed ones. She looked over the array. That stack is for the hotel employees. Logan wants to bonus them as a thank you for helping out with the wedding. That other stack is for guests who flew in for the wedding. Thank you cards. She pointed at another stack. That one is for vendors who sent wedding presents and need a thank you card letting them know we received their gift. And that stack there is for those that will be attending and leaving a gift at the wedding, even though we requested no gifts. And that stack, she pointed at another, is for people that were invited to the wedding but couldn't make it and sent a gift. She rubbed her forehead. I'm drowning in thank yous, and I'm not even sure I've got everything covered. Marjorie pulled up a chair next to Bronte. Need some help? I can stuff and seal after you sign. The bride sent her a grateful look. That'd be wonderful. As Aristotle said, a friend is a second self. I could dearly use another pair of hands at the moment. They worked quietly for a few moments, Bronte signing cards with her married name and a brief note, and Marjorie carefully tucking them into envelopes, sealing them, and placing them in the appropriate piles. They were able to speed up Bronte's production enough that the drawn, frazzled look disappeared from her face. So, Bronte said as she wrote, tell me about your week. Have you been having fun? Immediately Marjorie's thoughts filled with Rob. A hot flush stained her cheeks. I'm enjoying myself, though I have to admit it still feels decadent to have all this time off of work as a paid holiday. Since Logan owned the Sock Hop Diner, and Bronte had invited most of the waitresses to come be part of her weeks-long wedding plans, her filthy rich husband had arranged for the diner to be staffed with temps, who could handle things while the others were gone and sunning themselves at the resort. It seemed a ridiculous expense to Marjorie, but then again, maybe that was just something billionaires did. This place is wonderful. You look tired, though. Bronte's mouth curved into a wry smile. I never thought having a wedding would be so much work. I'll be glad when I can get home and just curl up on the couch with Logan. Marjorie had a hard time picturing the forbidding Logan Hawkins doing anything as normal as lounging on the sofa with his wife. But maybe Bronte saw a different side of him than Marjorie did. Well, anything I can help you with, you just let me know. I can't thank you enough for inviting me. Of course you're invited. You're one of my closest friends. Bronte put down the card she was holding and squeezed Marjorie's hand. And I'm so happy you're here. I'm sorry if I've been so absent. There seems to be an endless parade of things to do before the wedding, and I can't keep up with all of them. Are you having a good time, despite my neglect? Oh, I don't feel neglected at all, Marjorie exclaimed. I'm having a wonderful time. That blush seemed to want to take up permanent residence on her cheeks. I've been playing shuffleboard and went to bingo and have been working on my tan and just everything you can imagine. Shuffleboard, huh? Bronte giggled at that. I'm picturing you lording it over the shuffleboard court, a bunch of gray-haired ladies shaking their fists at you. Hey, I can't help it if I'm good at shuffleboard. Long arms. Rounding up all the people in the resort over the age of 75 and ensuring they're having a good time? Bronte's smile was knowing. Shyly, Marjorie sealed an envelope. Should she mention anything to Bronte? But the excitement of a budding relationship, after such a long, long dry spell, poured out of her. I had a date. Bronte gasped and clutched at Marjorie's arm. Shut up! You did, Marge? No way! Who? Just a guy, she said. I don't want to say too much and jinx it, but I really like him. She bit her lip, thinking of last night and how it had all gone from a nightmare to an almost magical sort of quality. Rob had been so sweet, so forthright. Blunt, but she liked that. She liked him. 
She even had a phone full of silly little texts from him, reminding her about their date later tonight, as if she'd forget. She'd been receiving them hourly, as if he paused during his day to think about her. That was a great feeling. Her friends, Edna, Agnes, and Dewey, hadn't been too thrilled to hear that she was going out with him again. They'd seen her tear-filled escape from the bingo hall, and it had taken a lot of soothing over breakfast to calm her friends down. It was sweet that they were worried, but they hadn't been there when the evening had changed from nightmarish to magical. They didn't know how Marjorie had been pretending to be someone she wasn't, and Rob had been doing the same. A date? Really? Bronte squealed, her hands fluttering in girlish enthusiasm for her friend. I'm so happy for you. You'll have to give me all the details when you're comfortable. Do you think you'll see him when you go home, too? Or is this just an island fling? That's how Logan and I met, you know, right here at this resort. I don't know if we'll see each other afterward, Marjorie said, running her fingers along the thick edges of an envelope. We're taking it a day at a time. That's the best way to do things, Bronte proclaimed. Epicurus said, do not spoil what you have by desiring what you have not. Marge grinned. Bronte had an incredible brain for memorization and always had a few words of wisdom from a philosopher at the ready. I've missed your quotes. Logan wanted to get my favorites engraved on charms for the guests, but I couldn't pick just one quote. So we decided to go with something more traditional instead. She rolled her eyes. How is Logan? Marjorie asked as Bronte slid a stack of cards toward her. She'd met Bronte's soon-to-be husband a few times, and he rarely smiled at anyone. He intimidated Marjorie. But the way he looked at Bronte, possessive and hungry, made her yearn for someone to look at her like that. Then she thought of Rob again and the blush returned. Rob had looked at her like that, like she was covered in his favorite ice cream and he wanted to lick it off of her, which was a mental image that made her blush all over again. Logan's stressed like me, or rather, he's stressed because I'm stressed. If it were up to him, we'd get in a helicopter and fly to the nearest justice of the peace and get married there. But there's too many people involved at this point. She grimaced as she scribbled a note on another thank-you card. And there's some jerk here at the resort that's driving him crazy. Oh? She shook her head absently, not looking up from the card she was working on. Something about some shady business guy wanting to get Logan's attention, so he's lurking around at the hotel. It's pissing Logan off, because he wants everything to be perfect for me this week. And that guy's like a burr under his skin. He showed up here just to get Logan's attention? That seems crazy. Marjorie shook her head. Crashing a wedding is pretty rude. Yeah, Logan's kicking the guy out before the tabloids get here. Apparently, he's major fodder. One of those party boy types that never met a hooker or a drug he didn't like. Marjorie blanched. That sounds awful. Doesn't it? She shuddered and handed another card to Marge. But enough about that. Tell me how things are back at the restaurant. Is Sharon still being a diva? And then some. She shook her head, stamping the seal on the back of the newest envelope. The pile was moving quickly, and the stack of completed envelopes was starting to take form. With help, Bronte would be able to get through these faster, and Marjorie was glad to be of assistance. We've had to redo the schedule over and over again because Sharon either calls in sick, comes in late, or wants a particular day off because she's busy. Bronte made an irritated noise in her throat. God, she's so awful. Want me to have Logan fire her? Oh, no, Marge said hastily. She needs the job, and she's really not that bad. She's just high maintenance. But let me tell you about the new guy Angie is dating. He rides a Harley, with a handlebar so tall that they're over his head. Bronte's eyes widened. What? No. Another guy? What happened to Bob? Bob was last month. Marge began to tell Bronte all the gossip of the job and the people they'd both worked with. 
She tried to pick out funny tidbits that would amuse Bronte without calling too much attention to anyone. The mention of Sharon was a reminder that Bronte was marrying the boss, and Marjorie didn't want to cost anyone their job. By the time they finished discussing the personal lives of co-workers and favorite customers, the stacks of envelopes were down to almost nothing, and they'd forgotten lunch entirely. Bronte picked up the last envelope in her stack and signed it with a flourish. Last one! I can't believe how quickly this went! You're so good to help me, Marge. You have no idea how much time this has saved me. I don't mind at all, Marjorie said with a smile. It's the least I can do. You know, Bronte said, tapping the card thoughtfully on the table, I've been thinking, how tied to Kansas City are you? That was an odd question. Marjorie shrugged. It's always been home because that's where family was. And now that it's just me, there hasn't been a reason to move. Her throat nodded at the thought of her beloved grandma and grandpa. She still missed them daily. And she was lonely if she admitted things to herself. Bronte had been her closest friend at the restaurant, and now that she was gone, she felt like more of an outcast than ever. She spent most nights at the nursing home, reading and playing games with the tenants there, trying to make a difference in someone's life, trying to feel wanted. Would you ever consider relocating to New York? New York? Marjorie's eyes went wide. She'd never considered it. She'd always thought if she relocated, she'd move south to Dallas or Oklahoma City. Never something at the level of New York City. Really? I've started up a foundation, Bronte said, enthusiasm in her tired face. We're sharing classics of literature with those that want to read. Some of our groups are schools, but a lot of them are the elderly. We have discussion groups weekly and organize outside events and get-togethers. It's really wonderful, and I'm so excited to do it. Logan helped me set it up. She beamed with pride. That sounds wonderful, Bronte, and it sounds perfect for you. The problem is that I'm doing that in between getting married, she grimaced. So I'm running on empty. Logan told me to hire an assistant, but I just haven't had time. And you're so good with people, especially the elderly. I really need someone like you. You want me to be your assistant? Oh, wow. But I'm just a waitress. So am I, Bronte said, grinning. But you're smart and dedicated, and we work well together. She gestured at the stacks of now-finished envelopes. And I'd pay you well. It'd be a big change, but we'd get to hang out more. And, well, it's New York. There's always something going on there. I never dreamed, Marjorie murmured. New York. Wow. Say you'll think about it. I need to run things past Logan, but he won't care. He... Run what past Logan? A masculine voice broke into the conversation. Both women looked up as a man in a starchy business suit entered the green dining hall, dodging the sea of tables anointed with upside-down chairs. He carried a large tray with several dishes and two drinks. Hey, baby, Bronte said happily. What are you doing here? I was told that my fiancé was last seen entering an empty dining room carrying stacks of envelopes to handle during her lunch hour. And I bet that you'd forgotten to eat again. He frowned down at her smiling face, utterly austere. I see that I was right. She waved off his irritation and got up taking the tray from his hands and lifting her face for a quick kiss, which he gave her. She set the tray on the table. I was just talking to Marjorie about coming to New York and working as my assistant for the Foundation. What do you think? Whatever you want to do. He looked over at Marjorie. Bronte takes on too much to do. If you can do the job, I'll pay you two hundred grand a year. Marjorie's jaw dropped. Bronte elbowed Logan in irritation. I was going to talk to her about salary. No, love. You're going to sit and eat your lunch, and then we're going upstairs so you can take a nap. You're exhausted. The look in his cool gaze became tender as he led Bronte to her chair and then sat down next to her. 
It does no good to have a wedding if the bride needs a vacation from her vacation wedding. Bronte just shook her head, placing the lunch tray on the table. Didn't I tell you he was pushy, Marge? I think you told me he was wonderful, Marjorie teased. Well, that too, said the bride, and she smiled up at her fiancé as he pushed a wrapped sandwich into her hand. Marjorie stayed down in the green dining room for another hour, chatting with Logan and Bronte about New York, the wedding, and most of all, Bronte's foundation. It turned out that Logan hadn't been joking when he'd offered her the salary. It was overpaying for an assistant, he said, but he wanted Bronte to have good help, and he didn't put a price tag on her happiness. And Bronte had just beamed at her fiancé with contentment. Marjorie found herself saying yes to the job, even without knowing all the details. How could she pass it up? Her job as a waitress was fun, but didn't pay all that great. Two hundred grand a year to live in a magnificent, bustling city and work with her best friend doing something that she would love? It was a dream come true. Someone was going to have to pinch her pretty soon because things kept getting better and better. She was still floating on a cloud of pure happiness when she returned to her room. The maids had come through and straightened things, the bed sheet so firmly tucked that she could probably bounce a quarter off of it. And on the nightstand next to the bed, there was a box with a big red bow. Curious, she sat down on the bed and stared at the package. Who'd left her a gift? Her phone pinged with another incoming text, and she read it. Did the package get there yet? Rob. She gazed at the box with the bow and reached out for the tiny card jauntily shoved into the ruffles of the ribbon. Wear these tonight. I hope they make you seven fucking feet tall, because then you will be seven feet of glorious woman, and I'm man enough to enjoy every inch of it. R. Heat stained her cheeks again and she pressed the back of a hand to her skin to cool it. Gosh, he was always making her blush, wasn't he? She pulled the lid off the box and gasped at the shoes inside. Silver platform peep-toe pumps with a nearly six-inch heel. They were studded with tiny crystals all over the shoe leather and glittered like Cinderella's glass slipper. She picked one up wonderingly. It was enormously tall. She'd be a giant. They were garish and impractical and sky-high. But they were also sparkly, girly, and utterly gorgeous. Marjorie turned one over in her hands, checking the size. Her size. How had he known? Her fingers smoothed over the Jimmy Choo stamp on the bottom of the shoe. They had to be expensive. Jimmy Choo didn't make cheap heels. She should return the present and just send Rob a thank you. But then she pictured his reaction. He'd cuss and stomp his way over to her room and make her take the shoes anyhow. And she kind of loved them. She was such a cliché, a girl that adored shoes. But so what? How often did she find someone that wasn't terrified of her height and didn't want her to wear flats? He liked how tall she was, and she liked the shoes. So she slid them on and nearly swooned at how good they felt. The leather practically caressed the arches of her feet. Impulsively, she took a picture of her feet in the shoes and texted it to him. Perfect, he sent back a moment later. Is this part of your seduction plan? she asked him. Might be. I'm pretty good at this sort of thing, huh? She had to admit that, yes, he was rather good at it after all, and she was really, really looking forward to their date tonight. So when do I get to see you again? he sent back. She gazed down at her gorgeous, impractical shoes. Then, impulsively, she texted back, How about now? Chapter 14 Rob wanted to meet her that afternoon, but he suggested they meet at a gazebo in the resort gardens. Definitely more romantic than the lobby, Marjorie thought with a smile, and agreed to meet him there in a half hour. 
She was humming as she changed into something a little sexier for her date, a dark navy slip dress that she normally wore with a sweater and leggings, and put on her sparkly heels. She felt rather pretty and hoped that Rob thought she was too. The path out to the gardens was on the far side of the turtle pool and lounge. The resort had several pools, but the turtle one was popular with couples instead of families due to its multiple hot tubs. She glanced at it casually as she passed by, and was startled when a man with a microphone and two guys with cameras seemed to emerge from the bushes and approach her. "Hey, doll," the guy with the microphone said. "Tell us your name, sugar." Marjorie hesitated, alarmed. "Not your doll or sugar," she told him, and tried to sidestep the men. "You're looking sexy today," the guy with the microphone continued, following her as she tried to go around them. I don't suppose you want to earn a little extra cash. Her jaw dropped.、W、what? That's right, baby. Tits or GTFO? He waved a handful of money at her. Show us your stuff, and we'll reward you. She stared at the man, gaping, and then at the cameras. Then, with a gasp, she ran as fast as her platform heels would carry her, heading for the gardens and the gazebo. Guess she's not interested," the man with the microphone called. "You're a lost, sweetheart." Show these horrible men her breasts. She was going to be sick. Horror made her rush, and her ankles protested as she stumbled down the path. She wanted to head back into the resort and hide, but the men were blocking the path. She was pretty sure she heard them laughing too. Humiliation burned in her breast, and by the time she found the gazebo, she was nearly in tears. She barely spotted a man in a black collared shirt and jeans sporting sunglasses. That must have been Rob. She stumbled as she approached him, twisting her ankle and practically falling into his arms. Marjorie, Rob asked, "You okay? What's wrong?" She leaned against him for a moment, relieved, and winced at the pain in her ankle. "I, I, here, sit down," he told her, gently leading her to the steps of the gazebo. And helping her get seated, are you okay? You look upset, and you shouldn't run in those shoes. A hint of a smile curved his handsome face. If you wanted something to jog in, I would have sent you something more appropriate. She couldn't even laugh at his teasing. Instead, she felt the insane urge to burst into tears. Marjorie clutched at the front of her dress and shook her head, unable to speak. Marjorie, Rob's voice was concerned. He sat next to her and took her hand in his, squeezed it. You gotta tell me what's bothering you, sweetheart. I don't like this. The endearment coming from his lips reminded her of the horrible man with a microphone, and she shuddered. There was a man with a microphone. He, he tried to get me to take my top off for money. In front of cameras, and when I said no, they laughed at me. Rob was silent. His lack of response just made her feel worse. I'm sorry, Marjorie said. Maybe I'm overreacting. I just feel accosted. That's all. Like they thought if they pressured me, I'd take my top off. It was horrible. He squeezed her hand. You do not apologize. He told her in a firm, angry voice, "I'm not upset at you. Just the situation. I can't believe those jackasses came after you." She shook her head and held his hand tighter. "I'll be okay. I just..." "No," he said, getting to his feet. "You wait right here. I'm going to go have a talk with them." "No, Rob. I'm handling it, Marjorie." He pressed a kiss to the top of her head and stalked down the path, his steps clearly furious. She blinked in surprise as he disappeared. Her awful feeling of distress giving way to a weird sort of pleasure. Was this what it was like when a guy got defensive over you, protective? God, it felt way too good, addictive even. She rubbed her arms and then hugged her knees, waiting for Rob to return. He did about five minutes later, rounding the corner of the tropical gardens. An irritated look on his face. He slipped his sunglasses back on as he headed toward her, shoulders tense. It's taken care of. 
Those fucking jackasses won't bother you again. Did you tell management? No, I had a talk with them. They listened to me, and they're going to leave you alone. His jaw was set, stubborn. Dumbasses. That must be the guy that Logan's upset about, Marjorie said. He told me at lunch that some tabloid creep is here on the island, trying to get his attention by crashing the wedding. We should tell him about it. Tabloid creep? Who, that guy? He thumbed a gesture back at the bushes. He's a peon. Like I said, he's handled. Yes, but Logan will want to know that I ran into him. Think, if he's attacking girls like me, he's probably attacking everyone that walks past. Logan's going to be so upset. It's taken care of, Marjorie, Rob said in a firm voice. He put his hands out for her. Come on, I don't want to give that guy another thought while we're on our date. I'd rather think about you and me. She put her hands in his and let him help her up. As soon as she stood, she winced. What is it? She shook her head. Just my ankles. They throb a bit. That's what I get for running in these shoes. Her grimace was apologetic. Which, by the way, are incredibly gorgeous and far too expensive. Hush, he told her. And sit. Let me look at your ankles. They're fine, she protested again. But when he turned that stern look on her, she promptly sat back down on the gazebo steps again and smoothed her dress over her knees. Give me your foot, he said, indicating the same with his hand. Reluctantly, she lifted one long leg and extended her foot toward him. He took it in hand, tilting her leg high enough that she had to quickly stuff her skirts down around her leg to keep from flashing anything inappropriate. Rob pulled the shoe from her foot and set it down on the pavement, then proceeded to rub his hands along her foot, caressing the bones and muscles. How does this feel? he asked her. Ticklish, she admitted, squirming a bit when he pressed his thumb to the underside of her foot. And it doesn't hurt there. It's my ankles. I was getting there, he said, his voice returning to its normal playful timbre. Can't blame a guy if he just likes touching a pretty woman's feet. And she blushed all over again, feeling shy. He continued to massage and manipulate her foot his fingers eventually moving up to her ankle. As he touched her, Marjorie felt a little weird and flushed and achy. It was embarrassing, especially because her nipples were responding in kind. Feel better? Rob asked. Yes, thank you, she said quietly. But when she held her hand out for her shoe, he pointed at her other foot. That one, too. And so she had to sit there and endure more of the awkward but exciting touches as he massaged her other foot and ankle. She was relieved, and okay, a little disappointed, too, when he finally released her other foot and then picked up her spangly shoes, holding them out to her. Thank you. Quit thanking me. I hate that you had to run here like you were scared. That angry look settled on his face again. Let's not think about it, Marjorie said, getting to her feet and testing things out. Everything was good again, other than she felt a little boneless and content from the foot massage. When she stood to her full height, she was easily half a foot taller than him in the heels, and the awkward feeling returned. You sure you want to go out with me in these? You are utterly and completely gorgeous, Rob said and I love the way you look in those. Don't make me buy you a pair of stilettos for every date that I plan on taking you on. I'll return them, she threatened, finding her voice. You can't make me take them. I bet I could. He waggled his eyebrows at her. I bet I could find the strappiest, girliest, tallest shoes out there, and you'd love them so much that you'd keep them, no matter how you felt. I wouldn't. Her protest sounded weak even to her own ears. Tall, girly shoes. Lordy, she was weak. What's your favorite color? I'm guessing you like bright things, despite that boring-ass dress. 
I think a pair of bright red fuck-me heels would look gorgeous on your feet. What do you think? He tucked her hand into the crook of his arm, and they began to walk through the gardens. I think they sound terrible, she lied. Gosh, they sounded lovely. I'd never wear them. You're a shitty liar, he told her, amused. It's adorable. She tucked a strand of hair behind her ear, feeling a little cornered. Rob, seriously, I couldn't accept shoes from you again. These are too much as it is. I bet they were easily six hundred dollars. Actually, I think my assistant told me they were three grand. Marjorie began to feel weak. Three grand? She had to work all month for that much. Rob, I can't... Take them back, please. She stopped and began to take them off. No, he told her, grabbing one of the shoes and forcing it back onto her foot. For an absurd moment, she thought they were going to get into a wrestling match over putting the shoe on her foot, and the thought was so ridiculous that she giggled again. That stays on your foot, and it's yours, he told her. It was a gift. It's a really expensive gift, she protested. Not to me. Oh, oh no. Her fingers tightened on his sleeve. Um, I forgot to ask what you do for a living. I'm in business. Why? The look he gave her was wary. Are you doing business here? No, I'm just here enjoying a little R&R. &R. With your assistants? My assistants could probably use a little R&R, &R too. She tugged at her dress, feeling a little uncomfortable. Rob, I don't want you to think that I'm dating you for your money. Her words trailed off as he threw his head back and laughed, and she felt a twinge of annoyance. What's so funny about that? You, he said, looking over at her with such a broad smile that she felt weak in the knees. Sweetheart, I know you're not dating me because of that. Not your sweetheart, she reminded him. Not yet, he agreed cheerfully, but the night is young. The rest of the night, Marjorie decided, was downright magical. They headed off the island again, which surprised her. But Rob said he wanted the privacy. So they took another chartered boat and headed over to a nearby resort for ice cream. They got cones, two spoons and sat at a tiny table in the back of the cafe and talked, sharing occasional bites out of each other's ice cream. And they talked for hours and hours, which surprised Marjorie. She'd thought that they'd sit down and find they had nothing in common. And while there were plenty of differences, there were also a lot of similarities. Rob was an only child, like her. Rob grew up without parents around, like her. However, though, she'd been raised by loving grandparents. Rob had spent his childhood in a state home. They both shared an intense sweet tooth, a like of Johnny Cash's music, and dogs instead of cats. More than common interests, though, Marjorie found Rob fascinating. She loved to hear him talk and tell stories of growing up, of famous people he'd met of the run-in he'd had when he was in the army with the drill sergeant that had screamed at all the men so much that they'd played pranks on him all through basic training. And she found herself opening up about her own past, her friends, her dreams. She even told him about the not-to-be-believed job that Bronte had offered her, and they'd celebrated with a shared root beer float. She'd reached for the straw and gotten whipped cream on her fingertips, and Rob had grabbed her hand and licked it clean, which made her feel giddy and needy all at once. And when the date was nearing its end and they could eat no more ice cream, Marjorie grabbed Rob's hand. Why don't we go down to the beach and enjoy the nighttime surf? Rob, brash, confident Rob, visibly shuddered. If it's all the same to you, I think I'd be happy never seeing another beach again. What? Why? You know why, he said with a grin. Some classy girl had to come and save me before I got pulled out to sea. I'd prefer not to have that happen again. I bet it wouldn't. 
I wouldn't take that bet. She shook her head. Then why remain at a resort on an island? I found something here that made me want to stick around, Rob told her. And his hand moved over her own, and he rubbed his thumb on the back of her knuckles. And Marjorie found herself blushing all over again. They went back to the resort, fingers locked together, and Rob walked Marjorie back to her room since it was late. They stood at her doorway, talking in soft voices. And when Marjorie reluctantly told Rob she had early plans in the morning, they got to the goodnight kiss. Rob's hands went behind her neck, and he pulled her against him, and they kissed for what seemed like forever. And when they parted, her breasts were pressed against his chest, her arms wrapped around his neck, and she was flushed and out of breath. Night, sweetheart, he told her in a husky voice. Not your sweetheart, she said automatically. Not yet, he agreed. They kissed one more time, and then he left her for the evening, and she went back to her room, flopped down on the bed, and touched her fingertips to her mouth. They'd only kissed. Rob had been a perfect gentleman. Why was that so thrilling and so disappointing all at once? Why did she want so much more? Wasn't she waiting for love, not lust? She'd waited this long. What was a few dates more, right? But she kind of wanted to see if Rob was interested in experiencing other bases with her. Hugging her pillow against her front, Marjorie thought about their next date. She wanted more than just a kiss. Now, how to get it. Chapter 15 As he left Marjorie at her doorstep, Rob adjusted his aching cock and headed into the elevator toward his new room under the name Ron Glasscock. His time with Marjorie had been a pleasant idyll, tinged with aching every time she laughed or licked her lips or brushed up against him, because he wanted her with an intensity that was driving him mad. But he had to play it carefully, because she was a virgin. He didn't want to scare her away. He'd go slow, even if it killed him. By the time he got back to his room, his cock was aching even more. Time for his nightly jerk-off session to Marjorie. But first, a call. One of his assistants picked up, Smith. Yes, sir? The tits crew. They're filming here, right? I believe so, sir. One of them approached Marjorie. My Marjorie. I take it she wasn't flattered, sir? No, absolutely fucking not. She was devastated. You tell those jackasses that if they come near her again, I will fucking ram their cameras down their goddamn throats. Understand? Understood, sir. Smith's voice was cool. Whom shall I describe for them to avoid? She's fucking six feet tall, Smith. Tell them to avoid any girls that are taller than them. Christ! He terminated the call, and when that didn't feel like it had enough oomph, he went to the room phone and slammed it in the cradle, over and over again. His own fucking crew... His own goddamn crew made the woman he liked feel like she was attacked. Jesus fucking Christ. How was he ever going to tell her what he did for a living? Rob groaned and rubbed his face, his erection gone. How do I get a guy to notice me? Marjorie asked at the bridesmaid's breakfast four days later, her fork toying with her scrambled eggs. The long table in the private dining hall was filled with Bronte's bridesmaids. Well, minus Angie, who'd found a new guy while hanging out at the resort, and was spending all her time with him instead of the bridal party. In her seat sat Violet DeWitt, who was dating one of the groomsmen and was becoming a close friend of Bronte's. All the women turned and stared at Marjorie as she spoke, and the table got quiet. Inwardly, she quailed but she forced herself to repeat the question. I want a guy to really, really notice me. How do I swing that? Boobs, Gretchen said, between mouthfuls of fruit. Guys love boobs. Audrey rolled her eyes and pulled off a corner of her dry toast. 
You'll have to forgive my sister, Marge. She doesn't believe in things like politeness or filters. Sure, I do, Gretchen said. But I believe in honesty more. She pointed her fork at Marjorie. Boobs, trust me. Or legs, Violet called across the table. Some men like legs, and I bet yours does, Marjorie. You're not helping, Audrey said, but a smile dimpled her round face. A good blow job, Maylie chimed in. They all turned and stared at the angelic looking blonde. What? she asked, an impish smile on her face. Don't tell me y'all don't do that kind of thing in the North. I'm suddenly looking at Stuffy Griffin in a whole new light, Gretchen said. Well, don't, because he's mine, Maylie said with a grin. And you can't have him. I don't want him. I have Hunter, thank you very much, and I'm not trading for anyone. A dreamy look crossed Gretchen's face. Then she looked over at Marjorie. Your guy, is he a virgin? Because let me tell you from experience, it is hell trying to nail that down. He's not, Marjorie said, cheeks red with embarrassment. I just want him to, you know, take things up a notch. Not necessarily get into bed together. Since the ice cream date four days ago, they'd spent just about every waking moment together. They'd played board games, gone to bingo, had dinner together, and simply enjoyed each other's company. It was nice, really nice. He never went further than kissing her good night. She was starting to get a little tired of nice, and the doubts were starting to creep in. Was Rob just not that interested in her? The wedding was in three days, and things were scaling up. Her time was going to be taken up by the wedding more and more, and then she would be flying home two days afterward. She wasn't going to have much more time to spend with Rob. And she wanted to. She really did. But she just didn't know how he felt about her. He held her hand, and he kissed her. And that was it. Didn't he want more? She did. I don't understand why we don't want to take things up a notch, Gretchen said. What's wrong with taking things to the next level? I love sex. Ignore my sister, Audrey said in a placating voice. You don't have to sleep with a guy to have a relationship move forward. Like you would know, miss. Oops, I'm full of your baby batter and we forgot a condom, Gretchen retorted. Audrey blushed, her face turning red from her ears to her hairline. One time, one time. This is crazy, Violet said. But have you tried actually telling this man that you like him and want to take things a step further? Because I find that grabbing a guy by the collar and telling him how you feel works wonders. You will never do anything in this world without courage, Bronte chimed in. Aristotle. I knew she had one of those in her. Gretchen said. She always does, Audrey said fondly. This was as bad as asking Edna and Agnes for advice. Thanks, ladies, Marjorie said politely. You've given me a lot to think on. Maylie beamed at her from the far end of the table. When in doubt, blow jobs. A chorus of snickers and giggles arose from the table, and Marjorie felt like the only one not in on the joke. She wasn't going to just grab Rob and give him a blow job. Was she? That seemed awfully like fourth base, maybe 3.5. She just wanted to see what two was like. Maybe three. Okay, she probably wanted to see three first. Chapter 16 Things were going pretty fucking good with Marjorie, Rob thought as he gazed at her from across the dinner table. She was animated as she told him another tale about another dress fitting, and how she'd gotten her dress and it was almost a half a foot too short. The bride had panicked and burst into tears, another bridesmaid had yelled at the seamstress, and someone else had gained weight and burst through her dress. Marjorie's expression was a mixture of amusement and sympathy for the stressed bride, but he had to admit that he wasn't listening to the story half as much as he was watching her movements. The way that she brushed her hair off her shoulders when she got animated, the way her eyes lit up when she talked about her friends, 
the graceful curve of her neck. Hell, he was even fascinated with the way her throat moved when she swallowed her drink. He'd never been this bad over a woman before. Never. What was fucking ironic was that he was okay with her being a virgin. He knew it going in, and he'd figured that he'd wine and dine her, seduce her into giving up her V-card, and then forget all about her. But the more time he spent with Marjorie, the more it didn't matter. Having her comfortable with him, seeing her laugh and her animated smiles, was worth so much more than pushing her to have sex just so he could get his rocks off. Not that his rocks didn't want to get off. They did. It was just that Marjorie was more important. He could wait a month or two or three, however long it took for her to be ready. Marjorie was his. He knew her time here at the resort was growing limited, and he was working on a plan to see her again after the resort. He just had to figure out a way to bring up who he was and what he did for a living. It still amazed Rob that they'd known each other for a week, and she hadn't once Googled him to find information out about him. She trusted him, and that was both humbling and terrifying, and it made him even more determined not to fuck things up by being his usual self. Rob, are you listening? Her brilliant smile faltered slightly. I am, he lied and then took her hand in his and kissed her knuckles. I was just a bit distracted watching you. Her cheeks pinked in that adorable way. Watching me? It's my favorite pastime. I fucking love watching you. She rolled her eyes at him, but she smiled. So, when is the wedding? he asked. Has to be soon, right? After all, his crew had already filmed two episodes worth of footage for Tits or GTFO in this week, and it hadn't flushed Logan Hawkins out of hiding just yet. Rob was running out of opportunities. Strange how thinking of his original motive for coming to see Turtle K made him feel guilty. Marjorie would hate him if she knew the truth. He shouldn't have hidden who he was, but he felt cornered. He didn't have a choice. If she knew the truth, she'd loathe him. So he kept his mouth shut and pretended to simply be a run-of-the-mill business guy on a business trip. And Marjorie was so trusting that she believed every word of it. The wedding? Her expression dimmed a little. It's in three days. He rubbed his thumb over her hand, enjoying the simple act of touching her. You don't seem thrilled. It's not that. I'm ready to go to New York and start my new life, and I'm excited for Bronte and Logan. Her smile returned, but it didn't have the spark he was used to. I just... Well, I'm not ready for this week to be over yet. I know the feeling. Christ. Her upcoming job in New York was going to be another kink in his plans. Bad enough that he lived in California and only flew into New York for business. How could he date Marjorie when she spent every minute with Bronte as her assistant? She was sure to get her ears filled with tales of how awful he was. Briefly, he contemplated somehow sabotaging the job offer that Bronte had extended, but then discarded the thought. Even he wasn't that big of a dick. It'd be selfish to ruin Marjorie's life just because he wanted her all to himself for a bit longer. A mischievous look crossed her face, and she got up from her chair. Come on, where are we going? You'll see, she told him, and tugged at his hand. He tossed money down on the table to cover the bill, and allowed her to lead him out of the dark atmospheric restaurant, intrigued by this turn of events. But a few minutes later, he protested when Marjorie took off her high heels and began to pad through the sand toward the beach. Oh, come on. You know I fucking hate the water. She only looked over her shoulder at him, her expression playful, and kept strolling toward the beach, her hips swaying with her movements. And he found himself following her after all. Are we going to walk on the beach? 
because I'm fine with that as long as we don't go any deeper. Marjorie simply laughed, and when she got to the edge of the water, she stripped off her dress. He experienced a moment of shock, then realized she was wearing a bikini. And, damn, when had his modest Marjorie bought a bikini? He stared at the tiny string tied at the center of her back, at the small stripy panties that barely covered her luscious ass. Do you want to swim with me? she asked, easing into the water. Her long legs were gorgeous in the moonlight. He was glad the beach was empty because his pants were growing uncomfortably tight across the groin. If I say no, are you going to get dressed? She looked back at him, smiling and ran her fingers over the surface of the water. You want to come in here with me. You know you do. This part of me does, he agreed, pointing at his dick. This part of me isn't so sure, he pointed at his brain. Her laughter floated up between the crash of the waves. It's still warm. You'll love it, I promise. The last time I went out higher than my ankles, I nearly became worm food, Rob called out but he found himself taking off his shoes and socks anyway, like a dumbass. I'll hold on to you, she offered enticingly, and then walked further out into the water until it was up to her breasts, and then she beckoned him. Come join me. Rob sighed. His hands went to his hips, and he studied the beach. It was near midnight, the tide high. The moon was shining down on the dark waters of the ocean and the waves rolled in rhythmically. The beach, normally crowded in the daytime, was completely empty this late at night. It would just be him and Marjorie. He stalled a moment more. I'm not wearing a swimsuit. Are you boxers or briefs? She called out to him, splashing water in his direction. Will it bother you if I say neither? I go commando. Always have. Her shocked giggle floated through the night air, making his dick even harder. Really? Really? You still want to swim? I do, she called out. I promise not to look. And she turned her back to him. Well, damn it, he kind of wanted her to look. Virgin, he reminded himself. With a sigh, he glanced around and then shucked his pants into the sand. This was going to be a huge fucking mistake. He just knew it. But he was drawn toward the frolicking, bikini-clad Marjorie like a moth to flame. The water was fucking cold, and he yelped as it hit his bare nuts. Jesus, you're a fucking liar, he called out. This is like ice. She only giggled, her hands moving through the water as she continued to stare out into the ocean obediently not looking as he eased into the water. He wished she'd look, though. He wanted her to gaze at him with wondering eyes, to check out his package like she had that morning in the hotel room. Then again, considering that he was probably shriveling thanks to the cold, it was likely for the best that she didn't check out his stuff. Yet. You're a horrible, horrible little tease, he growled under his breath, wading out to her. The water grew deeper, now at his waist, and when the tide rolled back, it sucked and pulled at his legs, and panic stirred in him again. Come back, he told her. Don't go out so fucking far. This isn't far, she said lightly, dancing a few feet away. I'm barely at chest height. Yes, but I'm shorter than you, he said. I might drown if I go out that far. She turned around and splashed him scowling. He put up his hands to block the icy water, chuckling. That got your attention. Cruel man, she said in a tone of voice that implied he was anything but. Hell, just that teasing note in her voice made his dick get all hard again, icy water or not. You're the cruel one, trying to drown me in the water here. He skated a hand over the surface. Do sharks swim at night? Do we need to worry about that shit? What about riptides? It's fine, she soothed. Don't worry, I'm right here with you. I fucking hate the water, he grumbled. Fucking hate it. Can't believe you're making me come out here. 
This isn't so bad, is it? She moved toward him a few feet, close enough that he could see the amusement shining in her eyes and the water lapping just below her breasts in that tiny string bikini. His gaze kept traveling downward, and he kept forcing it up again to be polite. At this rate, he was going to need a medal for sainthood. Something brushed against his foot, and he yelped and moved toward Marjorie in the water. What the fuck was that? She giggled again. That was my foot. Christ, don't do that again. His heart was hammering in his chest. You really are scared, aren't you? I think I have PTSD from almost drowning last week. It doesn't bother me too much until I'm out farther than ankle deep. Fuck, I don't even like baths anymore, just showers. Poor baby, she soothed in that teasing voice, and her arms moved to his neck and wrapped around him. I'm right here. You can lean on me if you need to. That's so. His hands went to her waist, caressing her skin just above the bikini bottom. He didn't know what had brought out this playful side of Marjorie, but he was liking it. He drew her closer, and his mouth moved toward hers. If you feel something jab you in the stomach, that's not the Loch Ness Monster, just my dick. She snorted with laughter a moment before her mouth went to his. Then they were kissing. Rob had learned something interesting about Marjorie this week. Every kiss with her seems to get better. Maybe she hadn't had a lot of practice before, but now when their mouths met, she was as eager for him as he was for her. Her tongue swept into his mouth without him having to prompt her, and her lips were open and eager as they kissed and molded and mashed with one another. Her mouth tasted sweet her tongue teasing, and he wanted to drown himself in the taste of her. Kissing Marjorie was an exquisite torture. Exquisite because he enjoyed kissing her more than he thought possible, and torture because he knew it would not go any further than that. His cock wasn't listening, though. It was an optimist, and his dick was hard with anticipation, practically pressing against her soft belly under the water. He edged his hips back slightly so he wouldn't alarm her by prodding her with it. Tonight, as they kissed, her hands moved from his neck and smoothed down his shoulders, her long fingers caressing his skin, and he shuddered under that light exploratory touch. God damn, it feels good when you touch me, Marjorie, he murmured against her lips. I like touching you, she told him shyly between little presses of her mouth to his. Her hands slid to his biceps, and she squeezed them, testing the muscle there. He groaned, his brain likening that exploratory little squeeze to her hands doing the same on his cock. Now he was aching with need, his pulse throbbing from her little touches. Rob, she said, voice soft as she pressed her mouth against his upper lip, then the corners of his mouth. Hmm. It was taking all his concentration not to grab her and force her hips against his cock, to have her soft, slippery flesh cradling him. Definitely bound for sainthood. How come we never do anything more than kiss? Ah, oh, Jesus. Because you're a virgin, sweetheart. The last thing I want to do is freak you out or make you feel pressured. Her hands skimmed down his sides, up and down, tormenting him with their soft little motions. What if... What if I took the lead on things? He stilled, composing himself. What did you have in mind? I want to touch you, she murmured against his mouth. And I want you to touch me. Can we try second base? Sweetheart, we can do anything you want. But you got to remind me what second base is. It has been far too long since he's dated someone that referred to bases. And if second base is anal, the answer is unequivocally yes. She gasped. No, not anal. 
Darn. What is it, then? His hands went to her hair, tugging it free of her ponytail and letting it sweep over her damp shoulders. So soft and lovely is Marjorie. It's, you know, petting above the belt. He could practically see the flush on her cheeks. That's so, but you're already petting me. Her hands were still gliding over his sides, even though his remained locked in place. Rob, she said in a pleading voice, her face burrowed against his neck. You know what I'm asking. You're asking me to touch you? God damn, it must be Christmas. She nodded, her nose brushing against his skin, her head still pressed against his shoulder. If she moved one more inch, his dick was going to stab her in the belly. I'll touch you, he said, gliding his hands up her back. But do you have to tell me if you get freaked out or uncomfortable? That's the last thing I want. All right. Her voice was so low it was almost inaudible. You said you've been to second base before? Once, she admitted. Her arms went around him and he felt her hands against his back, a mimic of his own touch. I think I mentioned the party I went to. I was drunk, and so was he. He saw how tall I was the next day, and complained to all his friends that he had beer goggles on that night. That fucking little prick. His hands clenched into fists. There's nothing wrong with your height, Marjorie. It just gives you an extra six inches of long legs, and I fucking love your legs. You might be the only one, she said, and snuggled up against him before he could warn her. Then his cock was pressed against her warm body, and she gasped. But she didn't move away. Is that... Yup. He stroked his fingers down the curve of her spine. I was trying to keep it off of you, but it looks like that failed. Want me to go put my jeans on? I... No, she breathed, and pressed her body a little closer to his. I like it. Dear sweet fucking God. She was pressing her hips up against him. It was like she was reading his filthy mind. Christ, your perfection, you know that? I like it when you say things like that, she told him in a soft voice, and then pressed her lips against his neck. He could feel his dick jerk in response, and he had to fight to keep his breathing even. If Marjorie was as unexperienced as she claimed, he was going to have to move slow as fuck to not freak her out. I'm going to move my hands over your back, he told her in a low voice, just exploring. In response... Her mouth pressed against his neck again, and he felt her tongue flick against his skin. Jesus, his virgin wasn't very good with the meaning of slow, was she? His hands moved up and down her back, carefully avoiding the string tie of her bikini top. Her skin felt deliciously warm in the cool water, and when she pressed her mouth to his neck again and began to kiss, he forgot to be slow and courteous and grasped her ass in his hands, pressing her hips forward so she pushed even harder against his cock. Her gasp rang in his ear, followed by a softly shuddering breath. Too much? he asked in a low voice. If he turned his head, his lips would move against her small ear. So close, and yet he wanted her to be closer. Hell, he wanted her under him, her legs wrapped around him, screaming his name. Feels good. Damn, you are absolutely my favorite virgin, sweetheart. He noticed she didn't protest when he used the nickname on her. Not anymore. That made him feel... fucking fantastic, actually. Almost as good as his cock cradled against her sex. She was tall enough that their bodies met up at all the right places and where he'd normally stab a girl in the stomach with his cock, it was at just the right spot with Marjorie. 
From now on, he was only dating tall women. Fuck that. From now on, he only wanted Marjorie. Her own hands fluttered down his back, and then she grabbed his ass. Just as quickly, her hands pulled away again, and she gave another little shocked gasp. I forgot you weren't wearing underwear. Did all that skin startle you? He chuckled. I liked your hands. Feel free to grope me wherever and whenever. Maybe she'd get bold enough to decide to experience his front, too. A guy's dick could hope. Marjorie's hands hesitated, and then she put them back on his ass. Her mouth went back to his for another hot kiss, and they remained wrapped in each other's arms for a long time, the kiss going on endlessly as they tasted each other, tongues intertwining, hands gripping each other's asses. His hands began to slowly knead her curvy buttocks, flexing and moving in what he hoped wasn't an alarming sort of massage. She took the cue, her hands mimicking his motions on her skin, and she clenched at his ass and rubbed. And Christ Almighty, it felt so good that he nearly blew his load right there in the water. Needing a moment, he pulled away from her hungry mouth, ignoring her small whimper of protest. How are you feeling, Marjorie? His voice was husky with desire. One hand reached up to cup her cheek and he brushed a thumb over one of her tiny earlobes. Were her ears sensitive? He intended to find out. Good, she said breathlessly. Can we... Can we keep going? He'd go until she told him to stop. Absolutely. Are you still wigged out about the water? Do we need to go in? I can honestly say I've forgotten all about the water. Her smile broadened, her mouth swollen from his kisses. That was the plan. Minx, he told her, pinching her ass. She yelped and gave a little jump of surprise, her body rubbing up and down against his. And fuck, her hard little nipples had scraped over his chest in a way that both of them had noticed. Marjorie sucked in another breath, and then she pressed her breasts against him again. One of her hands left his skin, and she fidgeted. A moment later, he felt the strings of her bikini top hit his hands, and realized she was untying it. He groaned and pulled her in for another kiss, just as the fabric fell away, and this time her bare breasts pushed against his chest. And fuck, they were nice breasts. Real breasts. Small and firm, like apples, with tiny little tips. Not big and like rocks, with distorted nipples from forcing so much silicone under the skin. Fuck me, Marjorie. I love your breasts. You... you do? Her breathing grew faster, and he realized she was nervous. Hell, she was practically trembling against him. I... I'm not exactly... Complete and utter perfection? he interrupted. To me, you are. Her dark eyes blinked up at him in the moonlight, as if analyzing that comment. Then she took his hand in hers and slowly moved it to one of her breasts. He sucked in a breath at the same time she did. It had been a long time since he'd felt a sense of wonder and reverence at touching a pair of tits. But touching Marjorie... Touching Marjorie was totally different from anything he'd felt before. Her breast was small in his hand, her flesh warm, despite the goosebumps that pebbled her skin. She was either cold or terrified, or both. His sweet Marjorie. He ran his fingers over her breast, tracing the curves of it with his fingers, his gaze on her face so he could watch each expression as it moved over her. Her eyes grew hazy as he touched her, her expression softening, and when his fingers slid along the underside of her breast, she gave an all-over body shiver. Ticklish? he asked. A little, she admitted, and her voice was so damn shy. How had she remained a virgin for so long? It was unfathomable. She was delicious. 
open and eager and gorgeous and all fucking his. A possessive surge shot through him, and he resisted the urge to crush her entire body against his again. She liked him touching her breasts. He'd keep doing it. He couldn't wait to see how she reacted when he put his mouth on one of those tiny, hard nipples. Want me to stop? No. Her voice was breathless. I really want you to keep going. Man, I love it when you fucking say that. His thumb brushed over the tip of one nipple. Her entire body quivered in response. That was fucking glorious to see. Do you like it when I touch your nipples, Marjorie? His thumb stroked over the taut little bud again, flicking it with his thumbnail. He was pleased when it seemed to harden and pucker even more under his touch. She nodded, and then her mouth formed a soft little O of wonder when his other hand slid up to cup her other breast. He gripped both of them, enjoying the feel of her soft skin and the reactions racing through her. The expression on her face was full of emotion, shyness and wonder and arousal all at once. Do you touch these when you masturbate? He asked her, leaning in for another kiss. She gave him a shocked look. Don't ask me that. He grinned. He wouldn't tease her half so much if she didn't react so wonderfully. Why not? Because, because I'm not going to answer. Her voice wobbled as his thumb stroked her nipples again, and her expression grew dazed. I'm not. No. Rob's voice was husky as he leaned in and pressed his mouth to her parted one. I'd love to know if you do, because I'm picturing these sweet little breasts and you pinching your nipples while you touch yourself. Marjorie's gasp sounded more like arousal to him, and she wasn't pulling away. Instead, her hands moved over his arms, his stomach, as if she had to touch him wherever and whenever she could. Lower, his mind chanted. Touch lower. But he didn't say that out loud. Too much at once, and he might short-circuit his virgin's mind. So he caressed her pretty nipples and kissed her, pleased when her tongue stuttered against his own with every flick of his thumbs against her sensitive skin. And when her sighs and panting started to turn to moans, he slid his tongue over her open mouth and took the next step forward. Can I put my mouth on your skin, sweetheart? Her assent was a soft moan and a jerky nod. Rob's hands went to her neck, caressing her nape, and he was pleased when she made a small sound of protest as his hands left her breasts. He pressed hot kisses against her throat, then moved to her ear, nibbling on her earlobe. She clung to him as he did, and he made a mental note that yes, her earlobes were sensitive too. He'd bet his virgin was sensitive in a lot of fun places, and his dick throbbed with need again. Then he kissed lower, moving across her delicate collarbones and down her breastbone until she was practically quivering with anticipation in his arms. He cupped one delicate breast in his fingers and brushed the nipple over his lips. She made a noise that sounded like, Gah! He couldn't help it. He chuckled. Her hands curled into fists on his shoulders. That's not funny. It's not funny. It's fucking adorable. Rob, she complained, shoving at his shoulder. Don't make fun of me. I'm not, he said, and brushed his lips over that sweet nipple again. I love each and every one of your responses, sweetheart. They're fucking incredible. She pressed closer to him, and he took the hint, pulling her nipple into his mouth. His arm locked around her back to hold her in place. His other hand went to his cock, and he began to slowly stroke it, hoping she wouldn't notice that he was working himself under the water. But Marjorie was past noticing much of anything beyond herself. She moaned loudly, and her hands went to his hair, holding his head to her breast. 
And fuck, that was sexy. He began to work his cock, even as he dragged his tongue up and down her nipple, figuring out what she liked. He used teeth. He licked hard. He licked soft, trying to see what would elicit the best responses from her. And all the while she moaned and clung to him, like she'd never felt anything like what he was doing to her before. Hell, she probably hadn't. And that just made him harder. He gave his cock a vicious stroke and immediately came, spurting into the rolling water. Hopefully she wouldn't notice. Your tongue, she moaned. Oh gosh, Rob, that feels incredible. I'd lick you all over if you'd let me, he told her in a husky voice switching to her other breast. The ache in his cock had been released, and now he was free to concentrate on her as she deserved. From your head to your toes, and I'd probably lick your pussy for hours, just to see how you'd react when you got all sensitive and needy. She shuddered against him, her little nipple tight against his lips as he spoke. I... I... What, sweetheart? He tongued her nipple, gazing up at her lovely face. A wave slapped him in the face, drenching him. He sputtered, and she giggled, and the moment died a little death. Are you okay? she asked. Before he could answer, another wave smacked him in the face, and he coughed, getting to his full height and wiping the water from his eyes. I don't think the beach is the right place for me to spend lots of time on your breasts, sadly. Not if I don't want to drown. All right, she said. I guess I should find my top then. They located her top through sheer luck, as it had drifted only a short distance away. Marjorie put it back on, and Rob watched her breasts move and shimmy as she tied everything in place. Then, when she was ready, she offered him her hand and they walked back to the shore, where Rob retrieved his clothes, put them on, and then Marjorie got out of the water. He figured she wasn't ready to look at him naked just yet. He supposed that was fine. For now. Chapter 17 Rob walked Marjorie back to her room that night, and they kissed at her doorstep for what felt like forever. He wished rather fervently, that she would invite him in, but she only gave him a shy smile, and that was it. That was fine, really. He wanted her to be comfortable, and maybe he'd pushed his Marjorie a little too far with their play in the waves. Maybe she'd realized he'd jerked off while he sucked on her breasts, and that had alarmed her. He didn't know what her boundaries were yet, mostly because she didn't either. Vaguely unsatisfied, but still pleased, Rob headed back to his room and undressed, showered, jerked off, and went to bed instead of turning to his computer for late-night work. He'd just drifted off when a noise woke him from his sleep. Rob peered blearily at his dark hotel room. It was almost one hour after he'd left Marjorie. He hadn't been asleep for long. What had awoken him? A soft, hesitant knock came at his door. That must have been what had roused him. He swung his legs over the side of the bed and got up, realized he was naked, and wrapped a sheet around his waist before heading to the door. A peek out the peephole showed Marjorie on the other side, hair tousled, looking anxious. She wore a pair of pink flannel pajamas. Oh, shit. He unchained the door. What's wrong? She rushed into his room, pushing inside. Before he could ask what the problem was again, her mouth was on his, and she was kissing him wildly. Stunned, Rob didn't respond for a moment, and then he slammed the door shut, dropped his sheet, and dragged Marjorie against him. They kissed like animals, teeth clashing, tongues molding against one another, until he grabbed her hips and dragged them against him, pressing his cock against her like he had in the water. She made a startled noise and broke the kiss, a flush on her cheeks. Hi, she breathed. 
Hey. He kissed her again, this time a little softer, since her lips looked bruised from the force of their shared excitement. Why are you here? I just... I... Her face grew redder and redder, and she looked anxious. She glanced down at her hands and then jerked her gaze back up. Um, you're naked. I sleep naked, he agreed, amused. She was so shy about the most random things. Here she came into his room, kissing him like a demon, and couldn't look at his erect dick without losing it. Plus, this was something she was already familiar with. Remember when you checked me out on the couch? She gasped. You were awake? Oh, yeah, he said, dragging her against him again. He touched a hand to her cheek and brought her mouth close to his for another kiss. So, what brings you here late at night, sweetheart? Her breathing against his cheek was rapid, shallow with excitement. I... those things you said to me in the water, I... I couldn't stop thinking about them. What things? He'd said a lot. When you asked if I touched myself, her hands fluttered, then curved over his shoulders and she pressed her forehead to his, her eyes closed. And I... I was going to do it tonight, but then I realized I wanted you to do it. Her words came out in an anxious rush. She wanted him to bring her off? Rob groaned. Fuck me. Not yet, she whispered. But can't we, you know, do other things? Hell yes, they could. He took her hand and led her to the back of the suite, where the bed was. He could feel her hand trembling in his, her fingertips cold. But his Marjorie had come here boldly, and he was going to reward her for it. She was about to get the best damn masturbation he could give her. Don't be nervous, sweetheart, he told her as he brought her to the edge of the bed. Easy for you to say. What? You think I'm not nervous? At her look of disbelief, he said, I want to make this a fucking amazing experience for you, one that you'll want to keep coming back to me for. And I've never dated a virgin before. So I'll take good care of you. But that still doesn't mean I'm not a little worried that I'll fuck something up. She rushed forward and kissed him again. Well, there was that answer. His arms wrapped around her, and he pulled her down onto the bed next to him, kissing her sweet mouth, until they were both sitting on the edge of the bed, next to each other, lips locked. His cock jutted obscenely from his lap, and she sat stiffly next to him. Still, he continued kissing her, hoping to get her mind loosened up enough that she'd relax. Her hands fluttered to his chest, and then moved away again. Ah, his nakedness might be a problem. He broke the kiss with one last flick of his tongue, and then asked, Would you feel better if I dressed? She licked her lips, blinking, and then shook her head. I'm okay. You're nervous. The backs of his fingers brushed between her breasts, and he felt her heart thudding. Would you feel more comfortable if I let you explore me? Her eyes widened, and she shook her head. I think that would make me even more nervous. He chuckled. Fair enough. He took her hand in his and then kissed the back of it. Then just look at this as an exploration of pleasure, all right? The only goal here is to do what feels good, and nothing is off the table. Understand? If you change your mind about touching me, or about any of this, all you have to do is say the word, and we'll stop. She nodded, and gave him another one of her shy smiles. God, he absolutely could not fuck this up. He kissed her hand again, and then turned it over and kissed each of her fingertips, nipping at them. By the time he'd gotten to her thumb, the look in her eyes was full of arousal once more. He let go of her hand and moved to the first button on her pajama top. Can I see your breasts again, sweetheart? 
She nodded, and her hands went to the buttons, undoing them one by one. Seconds ticked by as he watched her move down the shirt, pushing the buttons through the holes with shaking fingers. She wouldn't look at him. More nervousness, he knew. When she'd finished with the last button, he took the lead again, brushing the fabric aside and revealing her small, high breasts. God damn, you're a dream to look at, Marjorie. She sat a little straighter at that, her breasts thrusting out as she did. Then she eased the top off of her shoulders and tossed it to the floor. Her lungs heaved with anxious breaths, and her breasts moved with them. He couldn't resist the temptation to reach out and touch her breasts again, and so he did, caressing one peak and then curling his fingers around the weight of it. So beautiful and soft. I fucking love your little tits. I love how they fit perfectly in my hand and how those little nipples are just begging to be in my mouth. His thumb traced one, and he was pleased when it hardened against his touch. Marjorie moaned, and this time she reached for him, and her hand stayed put. Touch me, Rob, please. I'm not scared. I know you're not, sweetheart. It takes fucking balls of steel to come here and approach me, he said, lightly kissing at her smooth jaw. And I love that you did. Makes my dick hard as a rock. He pulled her in for another deep tongue kiss, and as she melted against him, he leaned back on the bed until they were lying down side by side, mouths locked. Rob rolled over on top of her, his knees separating hers. Her eyes widened at the press of his cock against her pussy. The material of her pajama pants separated their skin, but he could feel the heat of her, even through the material. Don't worry, sweetheart, he soothed her. Your pants can stay on, I promise. She relaxed a little at that, just gazing up at him with that soft, almost adoring expression on her face that made him feel like a goddamn king. Thank you, he laughed. Don't fucking thank me. It's your body. You call the shots, not me. It's my job to make you feel good. Her hand smoothed up his chest, rested over his heart. Then I make you feel good? Marjorie, he said in a low voice. He pressed his hips against her again, pushing the length of his erect cock against her sex. Did you not notice my heart on? I already feel good. Making you feel good will make me come harder than you could possibly imagine. That pretty flush was staining her cheeks again. What if I wanted to touch you? Then I would let you touch to your heart's content. But don't do it because you feel like you owe me. You don't owe me jack shit, understand? She nodded, a faint smile curving her mouth. Understood. Good. He bent over her breasts, admiring their curves, and then traced the tip of his tongue against one areola. I love that you came here tonight, though I admit I was a little surprised. He sucked lightly on one tip, liking the way her stomach moved under him as she shuddered. But I'm guessing that you enjoyed our time in the water, hmm? She made a murmur of assent, and her fingers went to his hair toying with a few strands before she placed her hands on his shoulders. My guess is that you were aroused when you got back to your room and you started to masturbate. Her sucked-in breath told him he wasn't far off the mark. But your hands didn't feel as good as my mouth, and that's why you came to me. Is that right? She was silent. Rob looked up, and the look of stark embarrassment on her face made him kiss the tip of one nipple. I'm right, he told her, and I find that fucking amazingly hot, Marjorie. The thought of you trying to get off after we parted, I love that thought. I love that you were that turned on. He tongued one nipple again. You know, I did too, right? You, you did? Really? 
I do every night after we part, he told her, pinching the tip of one nipple with his hand and admiring the goose flesh that broke out on her skin. Being with you turns me on so goddamn much that I have to take myself in hand after you leave. My cock's always aching at the thought of you. He lifted his head and gazed up at her. Want to feel how hard you make me? Her eyes went wide, pupils dilated. Then she bit her lip and nodded. He rolled back to his side, resting next to her. His cock lay like a rod of iron against his thigh, the head dotted with pre -cum. He wondered if she'd shy away from touching him, but Marjorie immediately reached for him, her fingers caressing the head of his cock. It's soft, she said with wonder. Fuck, don't tell a man that. My dick's actually so hard it's aching. She giggled. No, not your... your... Penis, she stuttered over the word, the skin covering it. Her fingers glided over the crown of his cock, driving him utterly mad. It's so soft. It's like silk covering steel, and it's so big. That's more like it. God, her unschooled touches were fucking with his head. Every time those inquisitive fingers moved over the head of his cock and stirred in the pre-cum there, he was tempted to jerk those pants off of her and sink home. But because he was going for sainthood, he closed his goddamn eyes and let her explore at her leisure. Her fingers moved over him, tracing the thick vein that ran the length of his shaft and then brushing over his sack. His balls were tight and aching and her fingers felt so, so good against his skin. Is your cock big, she asked, compared to other men? Big enough, sweetheart, he told her, voice raspy with need. As her fingers continued to stroke and test him, he reached out and cupped one of her little breasts, unable to keep from touching her. Probably big from touching her. Probably big and 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 touching her.